In a previous video on my channel, I made a board design video with about three hours of length that's become quite popular regarding KiCad and STM32 hardware design, including the schematic design, PCB layout, and then actually ordering a JLC PCB with assembly. Today, I'd like to do an updated version of this video, pretty much raw and unedited, but also in Altium Designer this time, so you can compare the design flows within KiCad and Altium. This will be good for beginners looking into embedded systems and so forth. I'll add an SM32 F4 based microcontroller, USB connectors, sensors, and so forth. So the whole design flow from start to finish. I've previously made quite a lot of STM32 based boards. For example, the latest one here is this little brain board containing various sensors, peripherals, and a very small package. I also have different videos on my channel regarding uh, the firmware development for STM32. So hopefully this channel can give you a bit of an overview of what it's like to start with embedded system design. Here are just a couple other boards that might include GPS, SD cards, different modules. And these are all boards I've designed. For example, this digital signal processing board over here and a smaller version over here. We'll be using JLC PCB, who are also the sponsor of this video. We'll be using their parts library, getting the board assembled and manufactured by them, and I'll show you all the steps that we need to do. Remember that this, that this video will be pretty much unedited, so I'm sorry for any uh, speech mistakes and so forth, but I hope this gives you a nice overview of how to design a board, and of course I'll leave timestamps in the description. Thank you also to Altium for sponsoring this video. Altium is actually offering a free trial version of Altium Designer, the software I'll be showing in this video, it would help me out a lot if you go to altium.com slash yt slash Phil's lab, and I believe you can get a 30 day trial. And I'll show you in this video what Altium is all about. So the parts that I've selected for this video, if you go to jlcpcb.com slash parts, they actually have a huge parts catalog. So let me just quickly show you that. So everything you can pretty much need, diodes, passive components, sensors, and so forth. And I've picked out a couple that I would like to put together on a board. The first and kind of the heart of the PCB being this SCM32 F4 microcontroller. Now, currently we have the global chip shortage going on, which is a bit of a pain in the rear end. So oftentimes these parts will go out of stock quite quickly. But basically the principle for these STM32 microcontrollers stays the same. I've opted to this time go for a QFPN package, which is a bit more difficult to then route and lay out because all of the pads and pins are underneath. So maybe something different for this video in comparison to the other one. If we look at the data sheet, we can actually see what this part can do for us. So it's a Cortex M4 core. It has a floating point unit, quite a lot of flash, a fair bit of RAM. USB, which is really nice because we can then flash it via USB, we can use it as a virtual COM port, and loads of different peripherals. I'll show you how to set up this STM32 microcontroller uh, late in the video with STM32 Cube IDE, and we can use that then to get all of the pinouts. Now, actually choosing the microcontroller or the suitable microcontroller for your purpose is pretty much a topic for a whole nother video. I've just selected this one because it's fairly powerful. At the moment, it isn't too expensive at about $6, and there's a fair amount of stock. Since then we have our heart of our PCB, we want to maybe attach something interesting to it. Just having a microcontroller on a PCB is pretty boring. I've opted to add an MPU6050, which is a sensor which contains accelerometers and gyroscopes and is typically called an inertial measurement unit. And we'll hook this up to the microcontroller via I2C and add all of the necessary peripherals and passive components around it. To power the board, we'll need some sort of linear regulator, or we could use, for example, a switching regulator. I'm using a linear regulator, an LDO, because it's pretty inexpensive, it's much easier to route, and it'll save us a bit of time in this video. For the sake of efficiency, you would probably usually want to go with a switching regulator. Of course, this depends completely on the scenario, if you need lower noise, what frequencies you're running at, what power requirements, what input voltage you have, output voltage, and so forth. The reason I'm choosing LDO First of all, because of simplicity, but also because I'll actually be using a micro USB connector to power this board. So it'll give us five volts at USB in, and we'll step that down using this regulator to 3.3 volts to then feed our remaining circuitry, which includes the SM32 F4 microcontroller, which can run at 3.3 volts, or rather anywhere from 1.7 to 3.6 volts, and we'll use 3.3 volts to feed this MPU6050. 
So this is our, these are pretty much the main parts of our design. We have the microcontroller, we have a sensor, for example, we have a linear regulator, so step down our voltage, and we have a connector with USB. The nice thing is if we use this USB connector, we can also get power, but also the data lines. And we saw before that this SDM32F4 microcontroller actually supports USB. All right, and at the end of this design, we will then upload it to JLCPCB. I'll show you how to order it and get it fully assembled and shipped to your home. So let's move over to Altium Designer. And again, you can use this link to get a free trial and kind of follow along for yourself, even if you might not be using Altium Designer at the end of the day. I hope this video will still be useful to show you some hardware and PCB design tips. So in Altium Designer, the first thing we need to do is go to File, New, Project. Uh, depending on what version of Altium Designer you have, you might have things like version control, but I'm just gonna click local project and give it a name and save it in a certain folder. Let me call this Altium STM32 example PCB, for example. You can add some parameters if you want to make it a bit neater, but I'm just gonna click create. You can see on the left hand side here, I now have an empty project. So the way it works in Altium is you actually have to add schematic files, library files, and so forth to it. The first thing I'm gonna do is right click and add new to project and schematic. You can segment your schematic so to different pages. One could be power, one could be the SCM32 microcontroller, one could be for the sensors, one could be for connectors and so on. For the sake of simplicity and because our design won't be that big, I will just put it on one schematic. On the right hand side here, we can change the sheet size just to make it fit. In essence, you always want to make it as readable as possible. So if other people check your design, you don't want them having to look around, okay, where the hell is this part? We have to save this, so I click save. And here I'll just give it a name. I will just call it uh, Altium STM32 uh, schematic, for example. Save that and it's added to the project. Later on, we'll also need to add a PCB design file, uh, which we'll do later. One thing that is different from Altium to KiCad is the way the library system works. In KiCad, we have libraries pre-installed with standard footprints and so forth. In Altium, that is a bit more complicated or different rather. We have, can add our own libraries where we have to create our own footprints and so forth and schematic symbols, but there's also this manufacturer part search. So I could type in something with like STM32, press enter, and every time I see this little green chip symbol, I can right click and place the part and add it to my schematic without having to draw the schematic symbol or the footprint. So it takes a bit of getting used to if you started out with KiCad, but I kind of prefer the Altium version these days. I've also created my own footprint and symbol libraries, um, so I'll add that now. So I've right clicked on here and clicked add existing to project. I have my existing footprint and schematic symbol libraries, which I'll just add to this design. And I will make these publicly available in my GitHub repo. I'll leave a link to that in the description below. So you can see I have now added some footprint and schematic libraries. So the schematic library, if I just double click on that and wait for it to open, is a collection of parts or symbols that we then place on the schematic. The way it works in Altium then is that you have to link each of these individual schematic components to actual footprints. And you can see, for example, the 3D view down here of that specific item. I can add manufacturer IDs, part numbers, any other parameters I want over here, even IBIS or various other models. Typically, I will always add a manufacturer name and a manufacturer part number. The way I've done it personally also is added just very generic uh, components like capacitors of a certain size and a certain voltage rating. Same for resistors and so forth. And any more specific components, for example, this, this flash memory, I will create my own schematic symbol and footprint. I have a video on my channel that describes how to create footprints and schematic symbols, and I'll leave a link to that in the description below. And I hope you can check that out before we move on. But going back to the SCM32 schematic, I will actually use the manufacturer part search over here. Going back to GLC, I simply have to copy the part number and then copy it in here. So sometimes, annoyingly, Altium doesn't want to do copy-paste, so I'm just going to type it in, F41CU0. 
CEU6. And luckily, it has this little green symbol on it that means we can place it on the PCB schematic. So right-click, place, it'll download it from a server. I just click, and there we go, we have it in our schematic. Another way of doing it is I've installed this plugin, I think this is the Samaxis PCB library, and you can click on that, and then there's basically um, just a database, you can type in the model name of an FCM32 microcontroller, click search, and in that way you could also add it to the schematic if you can't find it anywhere else. Usually I would recommend making your own schematic symbols and footprints using the datasheet because you can just be sure that you've done the right job, hopefully. Okay, so we have the STM32 F4 microcontroller over here. So let's add the other parts and later we'll figure out the pin out. To get an STM32 F4 microcontroller up and running, we need a couple different things. We need decoupling capacitors that connect to the power pins. We probably need a crystal oscillator, even though an STM32 microcontroller has internal crystal oscillators usually. But for things like UART, where the timing is critical, it's preferable to have an external crystal oscillator. There's one called the HSE, which over here is at PHO and PH1, the pins, and that's the high-speed external crystal. This will probably be something like 16 or 24 megahertz. We also have an, an LSE, which is a low-speed external oscillator, which is this OSC32 at pins PC14 and PC15. This is used for the real-time clock. Typically, I, most of my designs only have the HSE oscillator. In this particular case, this package has some other pins as well, including this VCAP1 pin. And if we look at the data sheet for the specific device, we will see that this pin needs to be connected to a 2.2 microfarad low ESR electric series resistance capacitor um, uh, to make sure that this pin functions correctly. Essentially, this is some sort of regulator input-output internal to the die of this MCU and you will find all of this information in the datasheet. And this will depend on the package, but most of the stuff I'm talking about here will carry over to all of the other SCM32 microcontroller packages. Some larger devices like the SCM32H7 might have more pins, they might have some power management pins and so forth, but again, all the information is usually in a reference design or in the datasheets itself. So, moving on. Let's add some power symbols, and an Altium that's up here in the middle. So I can right-click and place, for example, a VCC power port. If I click Tab, I move to the right side, which is the Properties window. I'll be running this microcontroller at plus 3.3 volts, so I'll type that in as a name, press Enter, and I can move it around on the schematic. Now, I place it using left-click, and I can use Control w to draw a wire. So I'm drawing a wire here, I'm connecting it to VREF, VBAT, VDD, and all the VDD pins. Now VREF Plus is actually, I believe, to do with the analog part of this MCU. So this will be the reference, reference voltage for the analog to digital converters. Because of the simplicity of this design, I will just be connecting this straight to 3.3 volts. For more sensitive applications, I would suggest using some sort of filter. So that might be a ferrite bead or a small inductor to de slightly decouple or low pass filter the voltage at the VREF plus pins or the VDDA pins. The, v v the VBAT pin, if not used, should be tied to V3.3 volts or rather the system supply voltage. Uh, you can also connect a battery in case VDD is down so the other supply rails are down. You can still run the real time clock using the VBAT pin. On the other side, we have the ground pad and we have these VSS pins. And these are for a ground connection. So right click up here again, place ground port. I don't like having the ground name show under the symbol. I think that's fairly obvious. So I'm gonna press tab and click this I over here to get rid of the ground name or other des the designator. So I'll move it somewhere, click to place. Again, control W and I can connect all of this up. There we go. Now. The first thing we need to do, again, for every supply pin, we need to supply a 100 nanofarad decoupling capacitor. And later on, this will be placed really close to the actual package itself. This is to help the chip actually source current from the supply because the power supply might have some inductance, it might have some resistance, and it can't 
get the current into the package fast enough. So we have some need to have some local energy storage in the form of decoupling capacitors to help the chip out. So I will go over to components on the left here and then go to my library which I created, which is schematic lib fills lab in my case. I can search. I would like to search for capacitor, which I've called cap, and I have various sizes here. I would typically like to go for 0402, which is, I believe is the smallest size JLC PCB assembles. And then I also have a voltage rating. Now the voltage rating should be at least double that of the voltage that is going to be across the capacitor, that is the DC voltage. Capacitors typically have a voltage derating, so the higher the voltage across the capacitor, the lower the capacitance will actually be from its nominal value. So I will typically go, let's say, with a 16 volt just to be safe. So I'll drag that in. I can press space to rotate, double click over here on the value field, and I can just type in 100N. That's 100 nanofarads or 0.1 microfarads. I can move it over, control W to connect it up, and I need one, two, three, four, five of these. So let me just copy, control C, control V. Five of these, there we go. Now, I can just move this over here by clicking and dragging. What I typically also like to do and what is recommended on STM32 application notes is to add a bulk decoupling capacitor. This might be something like 2.2 microfarads, 4.7 microfarads or 10 microfarads. Now this capacitor doesn't have to be close to any of the supply pins, it just has to be fairly close to the package itself. It's called a bulk decoupling capacitor. So let me add a larger package because typically larger packages Will be, it'll be easier to find larger value capacitances. So I'll go with 0603, again, 16 volts, drag that in, space, and let me put in maybe a 2.2 microfarad capacitor. There we go. Now I will just connect that up nicely. Let me just move that up. Control W as usual to connect everything up. And then I need to copy my ground connection. So Control C, and I'll just copy one over here and connect all of the capacitors up. There we go. All right, so remember one 100 nanofarad decoupling capacitor for each of the power supply pins plus a bulk decoupling capacitor. Now I've chosen 2.2 microfarads because I'm actually gonna be using this capacitor, copying it over here, to connect to the VCAP1 pin. Some of the SCM32 microcontrollers might have two VCAP pins, some might have none. In this case, I've got one, and that needs to be connected to a low ESR. I haven't had problems if I disregard the ESR part. 2.2 microfarad capacitor. So, note that the VCAP pins do not connect to 3.3 volts or any other supply. It's essentially, I believe, an output for an internal regulator. An important point is net labels. So all of these pins, when we later go to the uh, routing stage, will have the name or the net name 3.3 volts because they're all connected to 3.3 volts. Similarly here, these pins will all have the net name ground, G and D. However, if I just connect something to a pin or any component and don't give it a name, it'll have like a net name, like net name C201, for example. Now when I come to, to, to actually laying out or routing the board, that's really annoying because I would like to know what does this actually connect to. The way you can fix that is by pressing P uh, and then we do net label, so PN. If I tab, I can change the name of that net. I will just call it MCU underscore VCAP1 and then I can place it on it. This means this whole wire here or this connection is now called MCU underscore VCAP1. This tells me later in layout and routing that it's not just pin 22 of some random package. It tells me it's the microcontroller VCAT1 pin. This makes my life so much easier, especially when the designs get more complicated later on to actually uh, lay out and route this board. All right, so now we have our main decoupling capacitors and so forth connected. The next thing we need to look at are these pins over here. And you'll find them, I believe, in all SIM32 packages. The boot zero pin is essentially there as an input, either high or low, to tell the SCM32 microcontroller at startup if it should load its internal bootloader. The bootloader means it can be reflashed via, for example, USB, UART, I2C, whatever this specific device supports. 
if boot zero is low, the bootloader is not enabled and it'll just run the code that you flashed it to. If boot zero is high, it'll enable the internal bootloader so we can flash it via USB, uh, UART and so forth, but it won't run the internal code unless boot zero is pulled low again and a reset of the device has been performed. So, because in this example, I will just be using serial wire debug and we'll come back to that later, what that actually is, I will pull the boot zero pin down permanently. You can either connect it directly to ground, but I almost never do that unless I have space constraints. So let me search for a resistor and I'll search for a resistor and an 042 package, and I'll make that a 10K value resistor. I connect a resistor to the boot zero pin, pulling it low to ground, because maybe during a debugging phase, or if I'm not happy with my choice of the boot zero pin, I wouldn't have to cut up this trace with like a little pen knife. I can simply either desolder the resistor or just tie this pad on the layout high to actually enable the bootloader. So I would always recommend just putting a resistor there or a switch toggling between high or low. Don't forget, we actually need to call this pin something or this net and I'll call it MCU underscore boot zero. Always label your nets. So we just make it a bit neater. Then we have this N reset pin and the N reset pin, this N means it's inverted logic. So this device will reset if this pin is brought low. If this pin is brought high or left floating, this device will not reset. And you might want to perform a hard reset in some user applications if it's stuck or, or God knows what. Now, in most packages, and I believe almost all packages for SCM32 microcontrollers, the end reset pin has an internal pull-up. And this is fairly weak, a couple of tens of kilo ohms. And that's usually fine and, and you don't have to worry about that. To prevent spurious resets, I typically add a 100 nanofarad capacitor to ground, essentially forming a, a small filtering or debouncing circuit. And just to strengthen that pull-up internally, I will add an extra pull-up externally, usually 10 kilo ohms. This is just to help prevent spurious resets. We will actually connect the end reset pin up later to the serial wire or debug probe header. So the capacitor was to help just debounce this and reset pin a bit, prevent spurious resets. And I'm adding external uh, resistor just to 3.3 volts to make sure, you know, we can strengthen the internal pull-up. Remember, this external circuitry is actually, actually not strictly required. Again, I'm adding a net name, uh, MCU underscore and reset. Okay. So now we've done pretty much the main circuitry and this is almost enough to get it up and running. Of course, we're missing like the power supply and things like that. But if we had that in place, this would actually pretty much boot up. Because we might want to use things such that require a bit more precise timing other than the internal oscillators, I'm gonna connect up this PHO and PH1 pins, which are the ones for the high-speed external crystal oscillator. Now let's go to the data sheet briefly. So if you go to jlcpc.com, you can actually always find the data sheet, which is quite neat. And if you control F, so search for HSE, I want to see what speeds this oscillator can actually run at or what crystals it supports. And just by a quick look, we can see it's anywhere from four to 26 megahertz. So going back to the schematic, I'm going to search for crystal in my own library and I already have a 24 megahertz crystal in place. So I'm just going to use that. Remember the data sheet said up to 26 megahertz. So 24 megahertz is fine. And I believe JLC PCB has quite a lot of them in stock. Let me just verify that actually. So if I just type in 24 megahertz, let's check in stock. So there we go. It's, I think we have quite a few to choose from. Okay, so let's just go with the 24 megahertz crystal. So, this, if this component is flipped or not, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the crystal is pretty much symmetric. So let me connect this up. Again, control W, rooting it there, and this one going over here. So this is not enough, I'm afraid. We actually have to add some extra circuitry to the crystal. This is in the form of load capacitors and possibly a feed resistor. 
So let's talk about it in just a second. So the crystal, whichever one we choose, will have some sort of load capacitance written on the data sheet. So let's try and actually find one. Um, let me just find a certain crystal, maybe this one. There we go, here we have crystal. And it might have a term such as CL, which might be six picofarads. I'm not sure which one this has. This one has 10 picofarads. Now, the way we would determine the load capacitors, and these are essentially capacitors which we connect in this way. Let me just show you in one second. One over here and one over here. And these are connected like this, and then the other side to ground. Now, we need to calculate a value for these two capacitors, and that depends on the load capacitance of the specific crystal. Essentially, we take the load capacitance of the crystal. So in this case, I believe it was 10 picofarads. We subtract some sort of stray capacitance, maybe two, three, four, or five picofarads, and then we multiply that number by two. So we start with 10 picofarads, we take off, for example, five picofarads, that gives us five picofarads, and we multiply that number by two, which gives us 10 picofarads. So I know that was a pretty loose uh, explanation. There is actually an application note from ST. And if you simply Google for STM32 oscillator design guide, the first thing that pops up will tell you all about what you need to know, how to actually properly choose these load capacitor values, how to choose a feed resistor, and so forth. And here you can actually see the connection. So this is internal to the microcontroller. This is external. I've added some load capacitors. And you can also add this external feed resistor. I won't do it in this case because I've never really had a problem without it. This feed resistor, together with the load capacitor, forms a low-pass filter, which can filter out higher harmonics, higher than the crystal fundamental frequency, as well as it can reduce the dry strength of this crystal. Because if you overdrive the crystal, if this circuitry is too strong, if you overdrive the crystal, you'll get harmonics. And these harmonics could uh, influence the timing accuracy of the device, or maybe even not make it work. I haven't had problems so far, but maybe it's also good practice to just add a zero ohm resistor in series. Actually, let's just do that. So if I just cut up my connections here, I will find a resistor, a 402 package, just drag that in, and that needs to be connected to OSC out. So, and I'll double click, give it a value of OR. If my resistance values are below one kilo ohm, so I can't write like 1K, 2K, so forth, I will always add a capital R to the end just to make sure people know this is a resistance. So resistance series, and then I route that off to my load capacitor. And on the other side, that doesn't need a feed resistor. So zero ohms is really nice because essentially it's a short. And if I feel like, okay, or if I know, or if I can measure that my circuit has actually been overdriven or that I need to add some more low pass filtering, I can change this to maybe a 10 ohm, 22 ohm, or different resistor. Zero ohm resistors or do not place resistors are really, really useful in circuit design. Let me just add the ground connections to the other side and the crystal package. I think on pins two and four also has ground connections. Now, I can't forget to add net names. So again, P, N, I will call it MCU OS in and MCU OS out. Now, because I have the zero ohm resistor in series here, this net name is not MCOS out, and I will need to give it one. So you can see, actually, if I click on it, on the top right here, the net name is net C question mark underscore two, so not very nice. So let me copy, and let me just call it crystal in. There we go. And make sure you actually align it properly, because if I, if I keep my net name here, it's just very hard to read. So make sure it's always aligned and nicely visible. Okay, so now we've done our decoupling capacitors, we've done our main circuitry for the bootloader and reset pins, and we've added a high-speed external crystal. The next thing we need to do is then add some other circuitry. This could be our sensors, our power supply, and so forth. We'll later, at the end stages, do the pinout of this device. Okay, so the next device I would like to add is this inertial measurement unit. And this will hook up then to our, uh, our microcontroller, so MC, MPU 6050, I can look at the data sheet 
and I've used this several times before. It's a pretty standard uh, accelerometer and gyroscope, inertial measurement unit, and it, this one uses I squared C. If you go through the data sheet, you can typically find some sort of block diagram or hardware design description. It's usually close to the end, but um, let's see if I can find it. So for example, here you can see some sort of connection diagram, but I'm actually looking for a different one. This will tell you how to hook up this device. And here it is, after some searching, it's page 22. And this is the typical operating circuit. So we have the MPU 6050, and these are the essential components to make this chip function. Again, we need some sort of bypass or decoupling capacitors, various ground data connections, power connections, and so forth. This will also run off 3.3 volts. Uh, so basically, we need, just need to copy over this schematic into Altium. So in Altium, again, I'm going to use the manufacturer part search. And I'm going to type in MPU 6050. There we go. It's got the little green icon again. Right click place. It'll download it. And I can just place it there. One thing I have to say with these uh, manufacturer part search parts is I don't really like the pin description of these. So normally I would put my power pins right at the top. I put my ground pins at the bottom and various other pins grouped logically. So if you look, for example, this package, again, I have the power pin down here, some ground pins down here, and some, some the pins not entirely logically spaced out. That's the thing. If you make your own components, your own schematic symbols, you can decide that for yourself what you think is the best. Okay, so let me just hook this up as according to the data sheet. All right, so I've pulled up the windows side by side. Normally I have two screens, so I have... Um, for example, the schematic or the data sheet on one side and Altium on the other side to make it a bit easier. But for the sake of this video, I'm afraid everything has to be on one screen. So I'm going to start off with my ground connections, pop that over here. Again, because it's a QFN package, it has a center pad in the middle, which is typically called EP, which is connected to ground. Then what else do we have? Um, we have 13, which is our VDD pin, which can connect to 3.3 volts. Copy that, space to rotate, and that needs a 100 nanofarad capacitor, or they write it as 0.1 microfarads. Just copy that over. There we go. And that needs a ground connection. Okay, um, what else do we have? We need pin 10, which is here the reg out pin, which is not connected to any supply. Again, it's some sort of internal regulator again, and it's connected also to a 100 nanofarad capacitor. Drag that down and hook it up. Again, I'm going to give it a little net name. So P, P and N. Then I'm going to call it IMU underscore reg out. So this is nice because it lets you distinguish between different packages. So the national measurement unit is IMU and MCU is over here. And this will help me out tremendously when it comes to routing and layout later. We have VLogic, which is pin 8. If I look on the data sheet, that's a 10 nanofarad capacitor. And that is then called, connected to VLogic. The reason it's VLogic and not VDD is that actually we can run this device, this MPU 6050, at different voltages. So for example, if a microcontroller runs at 1.8 volts, I would connect this to VLogic to 1.8 volts because that's our interface logic voltage. Whereas VDD is the supply voltage for the remainder of this chip. But since we're running everything at 3.3 volts, it makes our life a bit easier, and VLogic will just be tied to 3.3 volts with this 10 nanofarad capacitor. So let me just change that to 10N. Whoops, that's not right, that's 1N. 10N, again, drawing some wires, VLogic, and 3.3 volts. Space to rotate. And because it's tied to 3.3 volts, I don't need to give it a net name. The net name is 3.3 volts. We also have CP, which is 2.2 nanofarads. And that is also some sort of internal regulator because it's not connected to any of our voltages. So let me just rearrange this a bit, just to make it a bit neater. And that's 2.2 nanofarads. So I'll just do 2N2. So I could write 2.2N, but the dot is typically harder to read especially if the, the schematic turns a bit small. Just imagine trying to read a dot there. So typically, I will always write 2N2 instead of 2.2N. I connect to CP out. 
that up here. This again needs a net name. So double click, I'm you underscore CP out. Okay, there we go. And I think that is all the essential circuitry. Then we, of course, you have all the data connections. So I squared C has two lines. That's a that's the data and that's the clock line. Now you can configure the MPU 6050 to do some extra funky stuff. They have auxiliary connections for another I squared C slave. They have clock inputs, clock outputs. But if you look at the data sheet, you can leave those pins floating. The way you tell Altium that it shouldn't care about that pins when we do a design rule check is to place an ERC directive or electrical rules um, check directive. So press P, go to directives, and generic no ERC. That means Altium won't complain at us for leaving this pin unconnected. Uh, so we can connect all the not connected pins over here. And actually, I believe the frame sync and clock in pins can be tied to ground. And if we actually look on the data sheet, there is this pin out and signal description. This is always really useful to look at. So if you look at pin one, which is clock in, it says optional external reference clock input, connect to ground if unused. Okay, then F sync, which is here, frame synchronization digital input, connect to ground if unused. And we also have this AD zero pin. And oftentimes you'll have that in I squared C packages. And this tells the chip if it's high or low, this AD zero pin, what the least significant bit of the I squared C slave address will be. So the least significant bit will be a zero if it's tied to ground, or a one if it's tied to 3.3 volts. Uh, I will just fix that to, to zero because I'm not running any other of these devices on the same I squared C bus. If I, for example, had two MPU 6050s on the same I squared C bus, I would have to tie one of the pins to 80 zero and the one from the other device, the other 80 zero pin, to high to make sure there's no bus collisions and so forth. So clock in, ground if unused, F sync, ground if unused, and AD0 is the least significant bit of this device. So if it connected to ground, I believe the I squared C address and hex is OX68. Uh, yes. So I think that's it. Let's have a look about the aux. So auxiliary, we can just leave those floating. So again, P, V, N. Let's leave those floating. The reserve pins says do not connect. And then we also have this interrupt pin. This interrupt pin can be configured to do various different things. Usually I use interrupt pins from things like sensors to tell me when there's data ready. This way I can then, the MCU can do whatever it wants. And as soon as this interrupt pin goes high, I connect that to a, a GPIO interrupt and that'll tell the MCU, okay, data's ready, start the read transfer. So I will actually connect that up. We can see the interrupt digital output is either totem pole or open drain. Because it's totem pole and we can select it to be totem pole, we don't need to pull up. If it were only open drain, we would need to pull up resistor. So I will place a net label and I will call that IMU underscore int or IMU interrupt. Place it there, control W to connect that up to the pin. On the other side, we have the I squared C clock and data lines. All right, so let me place net labels. Let me just make this big again. So if I do PN and then tab, I go to the properties of our net label. In Altium, you can see there's this thing called justification. And that's essentially where the anchor point of this net label is. On the right side, I will put it on the right. If I have it on the left of the component, I'll have it on the left. There we go, and tab again. I will call that IMU SCL and I will call it IMU SDA. So the naming for this can be a bit difficult because essentially these clock and data connections from the I squared C will go directly to the MCU, not via any sort of series resistors or anything. So it's the question, what do you call them? Do you call them IMU SCL or do you call them MCU SCL? In this case, for such a simple design, it doesn't really matter. I'm just going to call them IMU SCL for now. So hook them up over here. We'll come back to this, but I squared C is an open drain um, uh, bus. So the drivers are both open drain on either side, and we need to place pull up resistors on the bus. Once we do the pinout assignment for this microcontroller, we will add the IMU 
uh, uh, I squared C pullout resistors. I typically like to place the I squared C pullout resistors closer to the host, which in this case is the SM32 microcontroller. That's why I haven't included them at the IMU here. So remember, we'll, we still need to remember the I squared C pullout resistors, but we'll come back to that later. Effectively, this is now all the circuitry that's required for the MPU6050. If we connect this up and we, you know, remember to connect the power supply and so forth, this will actually boot up and run, given that we've connected it properly to the MCU. Just notice I also made a mistake here. I said not to do 2.2U, it's 2U2, because it's harder to read. There we go, 2U2, I'm glad I caught that. Okay. So let's look at the next bits we have to add. We've added the SCM32 microcontroller, we've added the MPU6050. Now, of course, we need some sort of power supply. Because we're gonna be using this Molex USB connector, which will supply both data and power to the board, uh, we need to step the five volts coming from the USB rail down to 3.3 volts. And I'll use this, it's a not the greatest regulator because it has a, quite a high dropout voltage but it can do up to 800 milliamps of current, which is complete overkill for this scenario. But it's such an easy, simple package, and it's so readily available that, you know, why not? So going back to Altium, again, using the usual search, AMS1117, 3.3 volt version, we have the little chip icon here, right click place, there we go. And this is our voltage regulator. Let me just, if I, drag my mouse and I can just move these components around just to organize them maybe a bit nicer. So we have that and the voltage regulator up here. At the end when we're done with the schematic we'll actually draw some bounding boxes around these parts just to segment, segment them a bit, a bit better. Now our power input will actually be coming from this USB connector so I'm going to copy the part number. Let's hope it works. Of course it doesn't. So, 47346 0001. There we go. Luckily, it's also green, which means you can right click and place. And we have a connector. So, the flow will be we have this USB connector. We'll connect the power and ground to our circuitry and the data lines to the microcontroller. So, let's get started with the USB connector. We have various mounting holes, and these mounting holes depend on if you're using your device as a device, a USB device or USB host. Now, I would recommend if it's a USB host to connect the mounting holes uh, to ground. Essentially, the mounting holes are the shield. If it's a device, you typically, I believe, want to leave these floating. So I will do another directive telling Altium to not care that I'm leaving these floating. Oops. There we go. So if it's a device, leave the shield floating. If it's a host, ground the shield. And there's various opinions on that on the internet, but this has served me well so far. I'm connecting ground to ground, and my V bus is gonna be roughly 4.5 to 5 volts. So I can place a VCC port, and I'll actually call that, remember to click this little I to show it the name, I will call that V bus. Just to indicate, okay, this is, the raw voltage, so to speak, coming from the USB device, VBUS. Now, the ID pin as well, uh, we will leave that floating. ID pin is used in on-the-go applications, so you can switch between host and device, but since we're only gonna be a device, we don't need to connect this ID pin. Now, USB power supplies are pretty noisy. So let's put in a Pi filter, which is essentially a capacitor, resistor or inductor or ferrite bead capacitor. And this will clean up our power supply just a bit before we feed that into the regulator. So let me go to components and look for a bead, which is a ferrite bead. So it's inductive up to a certain frequency, then it's resistive over its intended frequency range and then it becomes capacitive. So essentially it dissipates you could say noise energy, very loosely speaking, is heat. Typically, and ferrite bead, choosing ferrite beads is actually quite a complicated topic, and I'll leave some links in the description of how to properly choose a ferrite bead. 
you want to size it for an appropriate DC bias current, so the current that it's actually drawn from the supply. You want to cover a specific frequency range, and it's actually fairly difficult to choose it properly. For the really simple applications like this, you can get away with just using, um, I don't know, a 30 milliohm, 120 ohm uh, farad bead, connected like this, and we'll make that into a pi filter by using these 2.2 microfarad capacitors either side, connected up like this. And this will filter, at least to a certain extent, the voltage coming from our noisy supplier or from the USB line. Now, typically with connectors, you also want to provide some sort of ESD protection. And this could be in the form of some sort of TVS diodes. So I have, for example, like a TVS diode over here. And you would place that before any other components and connect that, for example, between VBUS and ground. And you want to do that pretty much on all connectors and then place these components close to the connector as possible. For the sake of simplicity, I won't be doing it in this video. Uh, choosing TVS diodes is another whole video topic in itself. And also keep in mind that a lot of these packages, for example, the SCM32 microcontroller or some of these regulators will have a limited, but they will have an amount of ESD protection inside. So far, I haven't had any problems, assuming you handle the boards, uh, the received boards fairly, fairly well with any ESD damage or anything like that. But I would always advise to add ESD protection. In this case, I'm not doing it for the sake of time and because choosing ESD devices does require a bit more time, more than we have in this video. But also to remember to look at the specs for the ESD protection of each of these devices and make sure you add them to connectors. So I also want to add then a power flag. So it's gonna be plus five volts nominally after we filtered it. So we get our VBUS in we filter it using this Pi network and we get five volts out. And this five volts will then be fed into our low dropout linear regulator. Because we'll also be using a USB, we will have to hook up these USB differential pair to our microcontroller later when we do the pinout. But I can really give them a net name now. So press P, N, tab, change the anchor, and I will call it USB D N. Now I'm doing underscore N and here I'm doing underscore P because that is one requirement to tell Altium that this will be a differential pair. Another thing I have to do, let me just move this over here, is then add a directive. So I can press P, go to directives, differential pair. So if I just place one, you can see the squiggly line means Altium is not liking something and it means it hasn't found the other differential pair. I need to copy it and put it over here. So now Altium is happy and I've marked that this is a differential pair. And we'll need that later when we do the routing. Another thing you can do and I typically do if I have many different differential pairs in my design, for example, USB 2, I might have some HDMI running and you can give them differential pair net classes. So I might call it diff USB over here. And then I'll copy that so they make sure they both have the same differential pair net class. This is important because if I have many different types of differential data lines that need different characteristic impedances, I can tell Altium later on to say, okay, root this with 90 ohms, root this with 100 ohms, and so forth. So that's pretty much our USB connector. Again, ESD protection when you're making proper, so to speak, designs. So now we will feed that filtered five volts into our low dropout regulator. Let's just actually go to the data sheet for the AMS1117. Let's go over here. Because we need to place input and output decoupling capacitors. So you can see scan through the data sheet, what is required and so forth. It actually turns out that you need 22 microfarad capacitors. There we go. Over here, typically you need 22 microfarad tantalum capacitors at the input and at the output. Now, tantalum capacitors are pretty nasty and they can light up in flames, I guess, fairly easily. That's why ceramic, ceramic capacitors are actually more than fine. 22 microfarad is quite a large capacitance for small ceramic, ceramic capacitors, so using 0603 or 0402 isn't probably the right choice. For 22 microfarads, I typically go with at least 0805. 
Again, I'm just going to choose 16 volts just to cover myself. So I will change that to 22 microfarads. So we connect that to 5 volts, 22 microfarads at the input, and 22 microfarads at the output. There we go. Now I need to connect up all my grounds. And that's it. So our USB connector provides a differential data pair, which will later hook up to the MCU. We have a fairly noisy supply rail. We filter using this Pi network. Again, it's quite involved to choose a Pi network. We get roughly five volts here, feeding into our linear regulator, which has a dropout voltage of 1.3 volts, meaning the input voltage has to be at least 1.3 volts higher than the output. So 3.3 plus 1.3 is 4.6. So we should be pretty much safe as long as the USB supply rail doesn't drop below that and we get 3.3 volts out here. So finally, we can hook up 3.3 volts to the output here. There we go. Now, what I like to do, especially for like test and development boards, is add a small LED to show me, okay, there is some form of power at the output here. So I will look for LED and I like a green one to indicate that I have power. So I'll hook the anode, anode um, up to my 3.3 volts, and I need a current limiting resistor on the other side. And an 0402 resistor is just fine. You have to make sure that the power rating is sufficient. But I typically run my LEDs, if I don't want them to, to burn my eyes out, at about 2 milliamps. Or like 1 or 2, just a couple milliamps. Not something like 10 or 20 milliamps, I think, is very bright for these purposes. Again, depends on the scenario. So typically I will go with something like a kilo ohm or 560 ohms. And that is just to indicate, okay, once I plugged in USB, do I get some sort of voltage at the output here? Of course, this could be five volts, it could be some, some other voltage that doesn't make sure or doesn't mean that this regulator is necessarily working correctly, but it's some sort of indicator that we have some form of power. Now, a mistake would be just to leave it because this net does not have a name. Again, I will press P, N, place a net name here, and we'll call it LED underscore power, and that's K for cathode. And I will make that small at about six, just to make sure it fits a bit nicer and doesn't cover the LED. There we go. This way, when we come to layout and routing, we can actually see what this thing does. Okay. So now we are almost ready to actually figure out the pinout for our device. So let's go over to STM32 Cube IDE. So STM32 Cube IDE is my preferred software development tool to actually program or do the pinouts for STM32 microcontrollers. It's really easy to get applications up and running. I have various videos on my channel of how to use this program, and I'll show you now how we can figure out a pinout for our microcontroller. So where we want to place I2C, where we might have, want to have GPIOs, if we want to have some external memory, we can use this to do the pinout planning. Of course, you can also just use the data sheet of the device itself, but this in my eyes is far easier. So uh, make sure you download it, it's free. Uh, I have it here, so file, new STM32 project, wait till that loads. And then you'll get this screen here, which is the target selector. Now you can either choose a board, you can choose a particular example, but what we want is the MCU MPU selector. And we'll type in the MCU we're using, which is the STM32 F411. So STM32 F411, and I believe it's a CE. Now you can see we have, we can see what package it is, how much flash it is, RAM and so forth. This looks like the right one. It's a QFPN48 package. So click on that, click next. Then we need to just give it a project name. We'll just do Altium STM32 example. Uh, Tag language doesn't matter for now, so you can just click finish. Then the project will just be initialized, be created, and then we'll be able to select our pinouts. Not sure if it just recorded that, so let me just do it again. I'll go to new STM32 project. It'll initialize the target selector. We need to choose the STM32 F411 microcontroller, which you type in here in the part number, 411CE. We want to choose the UQF, UFQFPN48 package, which is quite a mouthful. Then click next. We give it a name, 
Altium, STM32. This doesn't really matter for now. Just click Finish, and we get this Initialize in Device Configuration tool, and we're able to select the pinout in just a second. So here we have this view of the package itself, and this is really neat. So we can see things, for example, like the, the power pins over here. We can see uh, the device-specific pins, such as the boot zero for the bootloader, the reset pins, and so forth. So what we need to do, we can either click on individual pins, and we can see what they might be able to do. GPO inputs, analog pins, oscillator pins, maybe something like a UART or timer channels. And this is how we then can select our pinout. Another way of doing it is going over here on the left-hand side and then going through various menus here. So we can see, if we click on connectivity, the device can do all of these functions. Maybe not all of them at the same time, and that's what you have to figure out if you have a more complicated product. We will need I2C, and I will just go with I2C1. If I click on it, choose I2C, and it'll choose these pins for me. I can also control click on the pins and see alternate positions of these pins. In case I'm not happy with the pin out, I can move them around a tiny bit. If I don't like where the I2C pins are because maybe they're too close to the boot zero pin, I can just choose a different I2C bus. For example, here. The pins are spread out a bit, but maybe I can move them and things like that. So you can just have a bit of a play around, but basically let's just stick with I2C1 for the sake of simplicity. Of course we have, so this will hook up to our IMU. Uh, and of course we have a high-speed external oscillator. So if you go to RCC under system core, we can go to high-speed clock HSE, click and crystal ceramic resonator. And this enables the PHO and PH1 pins. Later on, you will then go to the clock configuration tab over here, type in your input frequency. I believe for us that was 24 megahertz. Choose HSE, and then you can set up things, for example, the clock frequencies and so forth. Basically, you can type in, for example, 100, uh, click Enter, and it'll try and find a solution for you. But this is later when we, for example, want to program this device. It's not really necessary for pin configuration, but it's nice to use this to verify that our clock or crystal frequency actually makes sure we can run at the desired speeds. So back in the pinout and configuration, we have configured the IMU I2C interface. We have configured the, the clock. We also need our debug interface. Because I've pulled boot zero low, meaning I've disabled the internal bootloader, we can only program this device, unless we pull boot zero high, via serial wire debug or JTAG. So in sys, click on debug, and I will enable trace asynchronous serial wire debug. Basically there's serial wire, which enables these two pins, which is the data pin and the clock pin for the debug probe, or if I click on this one, I get a third pin, which is a trace output. And this lets me plot variables and do other stuff. Typically, it's okay just to have the serial wire DIO and the clock pins, but if you have the space, you might as well root this one out as well. Okay, so what else did we have in our design? Uh, I think that's pretty much it. Um, what else? We need, oh yeah, the IMU interrupt pin, which should be an interrupt pin on the IM, on the microcontroller. So ideally that should be close to the I2C pins because I'm imagining the MCU is here, the IMU will be over here to keep the I2C lines short. So let me put an interrupt pin, for example, I don't know, um, we could do at PB8. PB8 I will choose as either an input, but if I want to enable interrupts and able to fire them, I have to click on GPIO XI, which is an external interrupt. Click on that. I can also right click on these pins and enter user label, and I will just call it IMU underscore int. This just improves the readability, but does nothing really to the functionality. Uh, just as a little tip, you, you also, once you enable interrupts, you also have to go to the interrupt controller and click this to enable the interrupts on that line. So that's pretty much it. Uh, what I like to do as well, we could maybe include a little header or connector that root out, roots out some of these other pins. And these could be fairly random. If you wanna choose, you could maybe choose some timer pins or, or something else. But basically, I'm just gonna make a little header and root them out to some pins down here. Just so you have a play with and you can see how you might be able to do that. Another thing I wanna do is include some sort of debug LED and I will just do that on PB13 
chosen pretty much completely randomly, I'll choose as a GPIO output and I'll right click, call it LED. I like to have at least one LED on an MCU. Just when I first get the boards and first program them, that's the first thing I'll do. I'll write a little program to just flash this LED just to make sure at least, okay, the outside circuitry is somewhat working. So now we have that, we can transfer that over to Altium. So let me just do that. So apologies for things being a bit small. What we already have are these oscillator pins, and that's over here. We already have the boot zero, the end reset. What we need is the LED. So let's start off with that. So PB13 over here is the LED. Again, I search for LED. And how about a red one this time? And again, I need a current limiting resistor. I will just choose 1K as well. You need to make sure that the microcontroller can actually source or sync enough current that you need for LED. Typically, that's going to be a couple milliamps, maybe five or eight milliamps max. It depends on the device and on the pin. So I typically just drive them with one or two milliamps, and that's usually fine. Let me just create some space for here. There we go. And ground connection and hook that up to PB13. Again, control W to make wires. So let me just create some space for some net labels. Again, press P, N to create a net label. I'll just call that MCU LED cathode. Oh, sorry, that's the anode. And I will call this the cathode. Again, for the sake of routing. Now these are overrunning everything, so I am just gonna change the font size to something like six or even smaller. There we go. This way we have a net label and we can, this will help us out with layout and routing. Again, current limiting resistor chosen fairly um, large to make sure we're not over or drawing too much current from this pin, which might uh, destroy parts of the device. Okay, so we have IMU stuff over here. So I can copy the labels from the inertial measurement unit these and move them to PB6, PB7, and PB8, which is on this side. So I'll change the anchor just quickly. All right, PB6, PB7, PB8. So PB6 was SCL. PB6 is SCL. PB7 is SDA and PB8 is IMU interrupt, which is the input. Now remember I said I squared C is an open drain bus, so we need to add pull-up resistors, and I wanted to do that on the host side, so we can't forget that. I'll look for some 0402 resistors. At a voltage of about 3.3 volts, I typically go with 2.2 kilo ohm resistors, both on the, on the clock and on the data lines. So let me just hook that up. And this is sufficient also for I2C fast mode in most cases. You can try and go a bit higher if power consumption is, a, is an issue, but this has worked fine for me so far. So hook them up to 3.3 volts, and that's it for the I2C and for the IMU parts. Now, we also have the debug connections over here. So that's PB3. Let me just move that over here. That's PB3, which is SWO, it's called. So I'll just call it MCU underscore SWO. Hook that up. We have PA14, which is SW clock, and that's over here. Again, I have to change the anchor. And that is going to be MCU SW clock. That was PA14. And we have PA13 over here, which is the data input output, MCU underscore SWDIO. Okay, that's just switched around. So clock is 14, DIO is 13. There we go. All right, so that is all the debug connections. We have the crystal, we have the IMU and LED. I wanted to hook up just some random pins pretty much just to show you that you can just hook them up to a connector so i'll just choose pa four five six seven i think that should be fine and i will just press pn 
I type in MCU underscore PA4 and I can click and nicely enough, if I have a number at the end of a net label, Altium will actually increment that number. So PA4, PA5, PA6, PA7. There we go. And of course, the pinout depends entirely on your project. It depends on our tiny needs, and you might have to do some rearranging and mapping around. I just want to show you a very, very simple example of how you can select a pinout and how you can hook up some, some really simple devices. Now we have some unconnected nets. What I'll do is again PVN to, for the electrical rules check. I'm just going to put that on the unconnected pins. So let me just do that. It's a bit boring. Okay, and that is almost it. What we're missing now is actually some way to access the zero wire debug connections. The way I do that these days, instead of using always a dedicated connector or a header, is use this tag connect footprint. Essentially, it's a little adapter cable for the ST-Link. Uh, the ST-Link is this little programming adapter, which plugs in via USB to your computer, and you can then pop that in with the SWD connections to your SCM32-based board, and that lets you program, debug, and so forth. Now, instead of using a dedicated header on your board, I use just these pads. So it saves space, it saves costs, I don't have to pay for a connector. The Tag Connect adapter cable is fairly expensive, but I think it's worth it because you save on space, you save on connector costs and so forth. So in the long run, it's worth it. So I've made a little footprint already in Altium. So if I just look for TC2030, it's a Tag Connect uh, solderless header. I just drag that in and we just essentially have to connect up VCC, which is our 3.3 volts. We need to connect up ground and all of the serial wire debug connections. So that's the clock, the data, this. And you don't have to. Uh, you can also connect up the, the end reset signal to perform a hard reset of the device. And I typically always do that. But essentially for debugging, all you need is pretty much just ground and the DIO and clock signals. But for the sake of completeness, I like to include everything. You never know when you might need these other signals. And this header is essentially our debug or programming header. Again, if we change the settings for the boot zero pin, we could use USB to connect. And that reminds me, we haven't connected USB. So let's go to SM32 Cube IDE. This is almost the main thing. So. We can go to USB on the go full speed, it, which is the physical layer inside the chip, click on mode and click on device only. And that enables PA11, which is D minus, and PA12, which is data plus. So PA11, D minus, let me copy that. PA11, D minus, PA12, D plus. There we go. Now we just have to hook that up. So, there we go, remove the ERC. Let me just double check, PA11 is D minus. Yes, PA12 is D plus. Okay, phew, luckily spotted that. And that's pretty much it. Now, I said we have these connections here, which you might want to connect up to a header. I typically use these JSTGH connectors, which are clicking and locking. Fairly nice. They're a bit hard to find these days, but I have a footprint for it. So let me just pop that in. So JST, it's a six pin header. In Altium, if I hold it and drag, I can press X to mirror and also uh, Y to mirror. So I'll just move the designate over here. I would advise to always place as many ground pins as there are signal pins. But for the sake of time, simplicity, and because we have a low pin count, I'm just going to provide one ground connection and one power connection to this connector. But typically, you always want some sort of return path for all your signals. Then I'll just copy this, press X to mirror, and then I can just connect it up. And to change the anchor again, as usual, and then just place them, and I can connect them to the visual pins. What I could also do maybe to make it a bit neater, neater, is move the connector over here. There we go. And then just route that 
directly out. And oftentimes this might be a neater way of, of then designing or routing your schematics just to make sure you know, okay, instead of having this air jump from here down to here to a connector, I hook it up directly. And I believe, unless we've forgotten something, that's pretty much it. Now you might want to provide series current limiting resistors between the MCU and um, this connector over here just to prevent any short circuit or limit the short circuit current. Again, you will want some sort of ESD protection. You might want to filter this 3.3 volt rail that any external noise isn't passed onto the board or vice versa. But for the sake of time and simplicity, I think we'll just leave it at this. The next step is then to annotate the components. So you can either do that manually by, for example, double clicking, changing this to J1, uh, J1, I'll get it right the third time, let me just try. J1, for example, for example, Farabade 1, Capacitor 1, Capacitor 2, and so forth. But you can also let Altium do that for you. The way to do that is to go to Tools, Annotation, and Annotate Schematics. And then it'll propose a certain um, 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 designator for each component. You can choose the order of processing and so forth. I typically prefer to just do it manually, especially for small, small schematic symbols. I, sometimes it can be messed up. Also in KiCad, it's a bit hard to get right the first time. Also how you've ordered your components on the page. So I'm just going to do it manually for now. So I've just updated all the, I believe, all of the component designators. And we'll see with an electrical rules check if I actually have an end. So the next thing is to just clean up the schematic a bit. I'll just do it pretty roughly now. But you essentially want to section things off. For example, there might be the power supply section. There might be the IMU. There might be the MCU. So I can just move this debug connector or the debug header down here. Just rearrange the schematic a tiny bit. I don't think it'll look too pretty, but let me just do a tiny bit. Then there's drawing tools in Altium. So you can press P then uh, drawing tools at the bottom, and then line. And then you can segment your schematics off a tiny bit. So if I just click and draw it around. And I can do this for all these individual sections. And for the IMU, for here, just fairly roughly. You can also change line thicknesses and so on. And for the MCU parts down here. There we go. Okay, another thing to do is maybe add some text. So I'm just going to rearrange this. Here. There we go. So we can do a uh, press T and then text string. And I can just type in, for example, USB connector and LDL regulator brackets plus 5 volts to 3.3 volts. And this will just help me later on to say, okay, this section is all this, uh, the next section is doing this, and so forth. Maybe make it a bit bigger. You know, you can spend quite a lot of time making it neat, but it oftentimes just worth segmenting your schematic, making it look quite neat. So microcontroller, four, uh, and let's say, I don't know, peripherals. Or well, let's just, no, not peripherals. Okay. And lastly, we have the inertial measurement unit, which is the MPU 6050. Okay, we might also, depending on what needs you have, I would typically also add the I2C address. And I believe for this device, because we've pulled the address zero pin low, it's 0668. So later when I get this board, it's really easy or much quicker for me to just get started, you know, in SN32 cube ID, I don't need to read the data sheet again, figure out what the ISO at C address is and so forth. I can also add other comments, for example, that the voltage here needs to be 1.3 volts higher than the output voltage or what the maximum current is of the device. It's always useful just to provide as much detail as you can on the schematic, because if other people want to read it or you haven't looked at it in five years, you'll much be much quicker to, to realize what is actually going on. Of course, I would also like to give this a title. So I will just give this a title up here. Let's call it Altium STM32 uh, example board. Then make that large. There we go. 
You can see on the bottom right here, we can also give um, the schematic a page name, number, title, drawn by, and so forth. And that's, of course, good to fill out, especially if you have multiple versions of this board, if you have multiple schematic pages. The way you do that is simply by adding a text string. And you can say, okay, this is the Altium SM32 example board. I can say what the author was, but you get the point. So we're pretty much done with the schematic. The way to check it or perform an electrical rules check is to go to projects and then right click and click validate. Now, if no messages have come up, we're probably pretty lucky, but typically you would go to panels at the bottom right and click on messages. There we go. And this is essentially our electrical rules check. You quite often will have warnings and errors, things you've forgotten. And maybe I have somewhere in the schematic which I haven't seen yet. But for now, the electrical rules check is looking quite good. We just simply have a warning saying that the MCU boot zero pin has no driving source. Okay, that's fair enough. Maybe it's defined as, a, as, a, as an input, which it is by the looks of it. And, you know, it's not being driven actively. But you can ignore that because, you know, we know it's, it's, it's fine. And other than that, it's saying compiled successful, no errors found, which is great because we can move over to PCB layout and routing. Of course, in the real world and when you're working on your own projects, you should thoroughly check your schematic, make sure the parts are right, you've designated it right, you've done the, 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 the pinout correctly and so forth. I haven't done it now because I'm doing this pretty much on the fly, but make sure to check, check, check your schematics and every step you do. So the next step then is to add the PCB document. So we have a schematic, but then of course you want to transfer all of this onto an actual printed circuit board. In Altium, we right click on the project, add new to project and add PCB. There we go, and we get a blank PCB page. We get various layers, we get top, bottom, mechanical, an overlay, which is the top silk screen, bottom overlay with the bottom silk screen, paste layers, solder mask layers, and so forth. I of course need to save this file and I'm saving it in the same folder as everything else and calling it underscore PCB to make it easier to see. There's some things I typically change if I go to project, project options, uh, class generation, I will turn off generate rooms and that's it. There's a couple of things we can do before we import all the components onto our PCB. One of them is, to, for example, to define a board outline, but the main thing is to set up our design rules and our layers and so forth. So we go up here to design and rules, and that'll load this document up here. So we have various rules such as clearance, uh, if we can allow short circuits, if we can check for incomplete connections and so forth. And all of these you would pretty much import from your manufacturer. So we'd go to JLC PCB, go to the capabilities section, and then see, okay, what are the minimum drill holes I can use? What are the minimum via diameters, the pad sizes, the clearances, and so forth. All of that you would import into Altium using this window over here. I also just seen I need to change my units from mils to millimeters because I prefer working in millimeters, at least when it comes to PCB layout. So I go to properties and click MM. So going back to the design rules, to start with the design rules, I always say, okay, I want to check for incomplete, incomplete connections. I don't know why that's not default. Uh, I don't want to allow short circuits. Clearance, typically I will set everything to be about 0 0.2. And 0 0.2 millimeters gives me plenty of room from my actual clearances that I need, according to JLC PCB, um, usually, and that's usually fine. Uh, but, but I would ideally advise just, you know, copy all the clearances over, copy all all of these definitions over to Altium or KiCad or whatever you're using. Okay, then I have things, for example, the width, the routing width. I will want my minimum and maximum widths to be uh, 0.2, let's say. That's far away from the manufacturer's capabilities and the maximum width at about one millimeter. My preferred widths for signal traces is about 0.3 and I can add that in here. So we also have differential pairs but we'll come to that a bit later. Because we're using differential pairs and we want to adhere to the USB 2 spec, I'll be actually using a four layer board with impedance control to help me out with that. This, is, this board is completely possible to route on two layers, but I'd just like to show you how to do the power planes and so forth, so that's why I'm gonna do four layers and show you how to do uh, impedance control as well. There's polygon connect style, so if we do power pause and ground pause, I would like them all to be direct connect. 
depending on your size of your power pores and what connectors you're using, using relief or thermal reliefs can help uh, with solderability. But for now, I'm just going to leave that as a direct connect. So I've done a really quick skim through all of these root, uh, these design rules. You should really take your time because this will determine the manufacturability of your PCB and how much it'll cost to manufacture. And make sure you don't get caught out when you're about to order these boards. We need to change this board to four layers. The way you do that is design um, layer stack manager then wait for that to load and we want to choose a four layer board. Here we are in the layer stack manager. I can go to tools and choose a preset of four layers. Then here we can actually have the board definition. So the stack up. So we have the solder mask, we have the type of surface finish, we have what the copper is or the copper thickness on the layer one, dielectrics and so forth. If you're not particularly worried about it, you can pretty much just leave it as it is. If you're not doing anything like impedance control or anything, this is probably fine. If you're going to export the step model and you want a particular board thickness, you will have to fill this out. We will fill this out with what JLC PCB offers as their impedance controlled boards. So if I go to the controlled impedance PCB layer stack up, wait for that to load, I can see for this stack up, this is what I need to import into Altium. So let me do that. This is for a 1.6 millimeter board. But let me just copy that over. So we don't, we only have one dielectric between the spaces. The core is 1.065 millimeters thick. The inner copper is a half ounce copper. What else do we have? We have 0 0.2 millimeter prepreg. Um, I think that's about it. We need to type in the dielectric constants of uh, the material. The core dielectric constant is 4.6, which is the core, which is in the center. And for the 7628 prepreg, the dielectric constant is also 4.6. So let me just enter that here. And this is useful then for calculating the impedances of the board. So if I save that and go back to the VCB viewer, you can see I now have four boards or four layers, sorry. Now, there is the type, which is the plane layer in Altium, which in theory is a great idea. The problem is that Altium exports the Gerbers as negatives for plane layers. And I don't really like that when submitting that for Gerber files. So I will also make these signal layers and then draw my own planes on them. Let me just change that to half ounce copper. There we go. Okay, so now we have our board set up. If we go back to the PCB view, we have the top layer, we'll have an internal layer one, internal layer two, and the bottom layer. In Altium, I can press two to be in the 2D view, I can press three to be in the 3D view, and this will be helpful later on for checking the design. But now we want to calculate our characteristic impedance. Remember I said we want to, we have this differential pair for USB, and we want to have a characteristic impedance of about 90 ohms. The way to do that in Altium is go down here to impedance, then I would like to add an impedance profile. I will choose my top will reference my inner layer and my bottom will reference the other inner layer. So I'll choose those two. On the right here in the properties window, I will select um, the impedance profile is differential and a target impedance of 90 ohms, which adheres to the USB spec. Now a trace gap, I typically use at eight mils and apologies for mixing imperial and metric. And that gives me a width of 0 0.26 millimeters. So I have a 0 0.26 millimeter track width with a track spacing of 0 0.2 millimeters. I can confirm that, or well, hopefully confirm that, using GLC's impedance calculator. So I want 90 ohms, four layers, 1.6 millimeter, outer layer, and it's a differential pair using an eight mil, not millimeter trace bath. And that's 10.28 mils. Converting that to metric, uh, almost. So got there in the end, 10.28 mils is 0 0.261 millimeters. And Altium is calculated fairly close at 0 0.26 millimeters. Given the tolerance, 0 0.26 is, is more than close. So perfect. So this is how we can use Altium's internal stack up editor and the impedance calculator to give us the right characteristic impedances. Okay, so that's what we need for USB later on. So let's go back to the PCB. The first thing to do before we can define some sort of board outline 
of course, you might have some sort of board outline because it needs to fit an enclosure because your mechanical team tells you it needs to be this shape or God knows what. But let's start off by just importing the components. So design, import changes. You can see these are all the components that and all the nets that will be imported. Then click on execute changes. It'll import everything, it takes a bit. And everything will be placed on the side here. I can again press three to change my view and have a little look around. So the first thing we need to do is then place all the components. So we'll place the MCU, we'll place all the components around that, we'll place the IMU, all the components around that. Once we have the layout, the rough layout, we can then define the board outline. Because if I kept the board this size and I have only these components, I mean, that'll look ridiculous and it will cost much more to manufacture. So if I don't have a specific or set board outline, I will place my components first, see approximately what space I need, then I will make the board outline. And that's what we're gonna be doing now. I will start off with my centerpiece, which is U2, which is our MCU. And I will drag that somewhere on the PCB. I can press G on my keyboard and change my grid size. So this is, it'll snap to grid. I typically go with, with for initial placement, like a millimeter or half a millimeter. So if I move it around, it'll be on a grid of 0.5 millimeters, as you can see on the bottom left here. I always switch to the 3D view quite frequently. First of all, because it looks cool, and secondly, because, you know, then I can actually check my placement. If things are close enough, if it's solderable, if, you know, I can get in between with debug probes and so forth. What I like to do is have a split screen view. So on one screen, I'll have this PCB, and on the other screen, I'll have the schematic. This way, I can work through section by section. I could, for example, do the power section, make sure, okay, I need to put these close to each other, I need to put this capacitor close to this component, this capacitor close to this component, and I'll do section by section. Once I've done the sections, I can then link them up, so to speak. So let's do that here. It's gonna be a bit cramped, unfortunately, because of the single screen, but let's give it a try. Okay, so I've now made two windows now, Tim. The way you do that is hold the document, the tab here, and just drag it out somewhere, and that'll create two windows. And you can have them side by side. And this is why I really recommend having two or more screens. So I'm just gonna start with the MCU. You could start with the power supply. You could start with the inertial measurement unit. But I typically always start with the, the heart of the board. And the first thing to do is the decoupling capacitors starting with the local ones, not the bulk one. So I will do C8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. So I can typically click on them. There's cross annotation in Altium. So if I click on one of these components, you can see on the left side, it highlights the one I've selected in the schematic. And this is really useful because I can select multiple components, for example, C8 to C12, and then they're all selected in this editor as well. There we go, and I can just move them around. Sometimes layers can be a bit annoying. For example, I have this assembly layer in pink and I might want to disable that. So I can go down to this layer view over here, right click on a layer and click hide to get rid of that. For example, again, I can click on this thing over here, which brings up this view on the left and I can use this eye symbol to hide or unhide layers. But let's get started with placement. So remember, local decoupling capacitors as close as possible to the relevant power supply pins. So we have at one, pin one, pin nine, pin 24, pin 36, and pin 38. So I'll just do it in sequence, starting with pin one. So I'll move it over here. Again, my grid is 0 0.5, which might be a bit too coarse. So again, I can press G, 0 0.25, and fairly close to the package. I don't wanna go like this close, because if I go to my 3D view, that's almost in my package. I'm gonna have loads of problems with shorts and clearances. So close to the package, but like, you know, not ridiculously close. Something like this is fine. This is like, if I press Control M on my keyboard and click one point and another point, it's the measure tool in Altium, and it's about 1.75 millimeters. And that's, that's, that's pretty all right. Again, you wanna do your rough placement first. This by no means my, may be the, the final placement. This is a very rough placement to get an idea and a feel for where things need to be, should be, and can be. Okay, C9 goes to pin nine. If I look on the right here, again, I hold the component and press space to rotate, just like I did in the schematic viewer. You can see my silk screen showing C9 is now in the component. 
For some boards, it's okay to have silkscreen and very advisable, and it's great for debugging and testing and programming and assembly. I prefer my boards without silkscreen. So I can select a component, which I'll just increase the view here, click Panels, Properties. This brings up the property panel, and then I can hide the designator. So I can click that, I can click on another component, hide the designator, and so on. So once I've placed the component, I typically hide the designator. For de to me, this makes the board cleaner, but of course there are, there are several drawbacks for not including component designators on the board. But for most cases, it's, it's pretty much fine, as long as you document the assembly and the placements well enough. So again, two to change the view. I can also use the rat's nest, which are these see-through, or well, almost see-through lines, and they tell me, okay, where do these components maybe connect to? For things such as power and ground, of course, we have multiple places. So as soon as we move the component around, these rat's nests will move to other places. So typically, always have the schematic open to know exactly where the component needs to be placed. So C10, which is the third one, should be at pin 24, which is over here, roughly. Hide the designator. C11 and C12, I could just move like this. So essentially, I'm just dragging to move, right? Pin 36 and 48. Click, hide designator. And the last one, C12, should go to 48, which is over here. All right. There we go. That's a rough initial placement of the decoupling capacitors. And this is, you know, not too close, but not too far away for these pins. So that's, that's, that's pretty decent. What we need to place is also the bulk decoupling capacitor, and that just has to be somewhere close to the device, and that's C7, which is in a slightly larger package, which is 0603. And, you know, you can place that anywhere as long as it's close. There we go. And that capacitor might move around a bit depending on, you know, where other devices go. The next thing to do is also this decoupling capacitor, which is C13, which connects to the VCAT1 pin. So again, move that over, and that is pin 22. Get rid of the designator, move it over. Okay, and again, I can really start seeing, maybe I have to move this capacitor a bit to the right to make space for this VCAT pin. There we go, maybe a bit more. There we go. Something like this, as an initial guess, right? This can always change and probably will change without the design. Things like the boot zero pin, even though important, you know, for layout, it doesn't matter pretty much where this resistor or where this connection is. It's a DC signal, it's no decoupling, anything like that, so that's not initially important. What's more important is, for example, this crystal. This should be fairly close to the device, it should be away from other interfering devices, it should be further away from things like connectors or uh, other sensors. So let's pick that out. So that's Y1, it's C5, C6, and R2. So I've selected all of them in the schematic, and that way I can highlight them and drag them in my PCB view. So let me just put them all together. And they should be somewhere over here. You can see my rat's nest. It says MCU OSC in, MCU OSC out. Now, again, to reiterate the point why I labeled my nets, I labeled my nets so I can know exactly, okay, this is not net x179 underscore 29. This tells me properly what the net name is, and I can connect it up really nicely. So I immediately know these pins have to go to my oscillator. I have my series resistor, which is our zero ohm resistor, which you might want to switch out. And that has to feed through. Now, the crystal oscillator actually doesn't have to be as close as these decoupling capacitors. It can be somewhere, for example, down here. Close enough, but not, you know, as close as the decoupling capacitors. The load capacitors of the crystal should be in line with the traces. So it shouldn't be like, you know, this and this. This is not what it should be like. Because I would have to route the traces, you know, out like this, there, and then out like that. Which creates stubs. What I want is in line with the traces, and you'll see that later when we do the routing. So something like this, for example. This way, I can root out, root into the crystal in, in there, and this one I can root out underneath the crystal there and back into the device. And this is something that just comes 
um, when you've done this a couple of times. So close to the crystal itself, not too close, series resistor in the way, and you know, fairly close to the package. I mean, this is only, what, like a couple of millimeters away, and that's, that's typically fine. It's not like this is a particularly high speed signal. It is sensitive, um, but this is typically a fine placement. You can see QFN packages also on another note are a bit more difficult to route because the pitch of the pads is quite close and we can't really route underneath the package as you could with, for example, a QFP package. The whole thing here is full of ground, a whole ground pad, so we can't route from here into the right. We have to go out. And this can be sometimes a bit more you know, difficult with routing these types of packages. Okay, but anyway. We have the crystals, we have the decoupling capacitors, we have uh, the VCAP pin. Now we can root or actually place things that are less important. For example, the LED, for example, the end reset circuitry, for example, the pull-up resistors. Those are secondary, so to speak, to things like decoupling capacitors and crystals. So let's find those. How about the boot zero resistor over here? And I believe that goes somewhere up here. Placement of this is really not critical. I'm going to rotate it so it's like this. The reason I'm doing that, I could have done it like this, you know, so I can link up these ground connections. I also have this interrupt pin over here. So if I want to root out, I'll have to do a via. I have to dig down. So I can just rotate it here to make sure I can root out my interrupt pin to the side and my boot zero pin out straight and these data pins and clock pins out to the right just planning ahead slightly. And again, this can be, I mean, this could be really far away for the sake of it. It doesn't really matter where this resistor is, but you know, for the sake of being neat, fairly close to the device, but not as close as decoupling capacitors. Then we have things like the LED and the current limiting resistor. I might as well actually take all of this stuff and just move it closer so I always don't have to zoom out. There we go. So LED, and resistor. That has to go somewhere here. Again, the rat's nest is helping me where I need to place it, or where it needs to connect to, rather. Get rid of the designator. You can see for the footprint of the LED, I've added this, uh, what, what do you call it? Just like this indication around it. This always indicates to me that this is the cathode of the LED. For any device which has a polarity or a pin one location, you need to mark that location on the silk screen. For this QFN package, the dot indicates that this is pin one. For the LED, for this diode, it marks that this is the cathode. Now there's different ways of marking it, and there's standards for this, but make sure that you do mark it. Again, this is a not critical component. I can see all of these pins around it are not used, so I can put it, you know, fairly close. Current limiting resistor, fairly close, and that's it. I could also put the current, ling current limiting resistor over here, just to make it neater, that it doesn't jump out that much. Again, press three to just check with a 3D view. Okay, and now we have the end reset circuitry, R7 and C14. Now the end reset pin, I believe is somewhere near the crystal, which is a bit annoying, which means, you know, I have to root the crystal out here, the end reset pin over here, and we have this decoupling capacitor. So what I do in this case is move the decoupling capacitor a bit lower. This trace length is still fine. I can root out the oscillator and I can root with a fairly thin trace and reset signal down and out over here. So essentially the end reset circuitry should be placed, you know, maybe here. On the other hand, because the end reset signal together with the serial wire debug connections over here connect to this header, and these connections are over here, you know, we actually automatically ultimately have to end up over here. So it might be better to place the end reset circuitry, you know, up here somewhere. This isn't critical. It's an almost DC signal, this MCU end reset. So we can pretty much place it where we want. So in essence, because I have my, this is the debug header, which I mentioned previously, this solderless header and that connects all of the MCU's serial wire debug pins. And that's gonna be somewhere close to the serial wire clock, serial wire debug, and the SWO pins. So I'm gonna place that somewhere over here. And as I said before, the MCU and reset circuitry is also 
connected over there. So we have to go from this pin, somehow get over there. So that's why I can place R7 and C14 over there. Again, component designators, get rid of that. Put the pull-up resistor there and the capacitor to ground down there. There we go. 3D view. Again, non-critical components, and this is pretty much for you to decide what those are. I mean, there's standard guidelines for it. Can be placed further away. Then we lastly have these pull-up resistors on the I2C bus. Again, I like to keep those close to the host, R3, R4. So that one and that one. I don't know why there's some artifacts here. Let's just do that. Okay. So SDA is on this side and SCL is on that side. So that way I can route out SDA going past here into this resistor on the way and SCL, you know, branch it out fairly quickly and go up here. But we'll do that when we get to the routing stage. Okay, so that's, I think, pretty much it for the MCU. We have the connector as well. Remember this GPIO header over here. And I can just place that fairly close to the device, you know, maybe somewhere down here. And we'll fit the board outline then to this chip and to this circuitry. Okay, so we can do the next part now. I think that's pretty much it for this MCU. So nothing too hard with regards to layout. Just remember decoupling capacitors close, crystal fairly close, um, things like that. The inertial measurement unit we could do next. Another QFN package. So that's U3. So I'm just going to place that on its own little island for now. And then we'll move that into place once we've placed the components around it. So what this needs is essentially just the decoupling capacitors, and that's it. So C15 to C18. So C15 has to go to pin 13. Where is that? Over there. Again, close to the device, but not too close. All right? If we go to the 3D view, which I always find is very helpful, if you're moving that part really close, it's going to be really hard to solder, you get shorts, it'll be harder to debug if things go wrong. So this kind of distance is perfectly adequate. Then we have, for example, pin 10 to C16, which should be down here. Space to rotate as usual. And we also have 8 next to it, which is C17. C17. Okay, so we can pop that next to it. In this case, you have several options. So you could either route it out like this, ground and rig out, and the 3.3 volts here. What you could also do, because this is a fairly non-critical part, it's a very slow part, um, you can route it also like this. So 3.3 volts out here, I'm you rig out like this, and ground just connected to the internal, or the, the ground pad in the center. So we could do that for simplicity. Remember to keep a bit of spacing between the parts. This is not entirely optimal in terms of inductance because you want essentially the ground and 3 3 volt connections as close as possible and same with the IMU rig out. So ideally, if we had smaller parts, it would be something like this, you know, routing 3 3 volts here, ground here, rig out here, and ground like that. But it kind of depends on the scenario. But actually, let's just keep it like this for now. So we have C18 which is IMU CP out, which goes to pin 20, which seems to be somewhere up here. There we go. You can see I can, I can either have the component rotated like this or like this. This is not good because it's in the way of SDA and SCL, and it's not good because essentially the loop between IMU CP out and ground might be more favorable in this way. Again, keeping a bit of space between the pads. And that's it for the layout, pretty much, of the IM inertial measurement unit. Now, you want to see that the SDA and SCL lines are connected to the MCU. And that means we have to move this whole section maybe somewhere over here. I could put it up here, 
but that will just increase the length of my board. Because I have a bit little square of space, I can put it over here. This is good because it's, you know, it's close to the MCU. The data lines won't be too long. And it's further away, or far, far enough away from this crystal section over here. We might want to play around with the placement of our uh, SDA and SEL pull-up resistors, but we can figure that out when we get to routing. This is a really, really rough placement to start with. You can see MCU, crystal, we have the IMU, debug header, and just GPO header over here. This is really rough, and we'll probably move that around a bit when we come to routing. Okay, so the next thing we need um, is the power circuitry, which is over here. So we have the USB connector, we have this Pi filter, our low drawback regulator, and the um, power on LED. So I don't really like the way Altium or whoever made this footprint made this footprint. I don't like these pad sizes. I think you know they're just on the edge of what, what it should be. The way you can change them on the fly is uh, click on the part, click this little symbol here, this lock primitives, which unlocks the primitives. I can go to the top layer, which is my top copper, select the pads, and I can change their shape. For example, I want to make them rectangular or round, and I want to change the pad sizes because I think that there's just a tiny bit too small. I'm just going to make them square. This looks a bit better to me. It helps with the soldering process. And also this pad I want to change. It doesn't look doesn't look too great. Again, uh, I can make that into a rectangular shape and just make it just, you know, just a tiny bit bigger. Does that look better? Yeah, I think that's better. All right. Once you're done with editing the, the part, of course, this isn't the optimal way of doing it, but on the fly, it's fine. Go back to primitives and click lock. Okay, so C3 and C4 should be as close as possible to the part itself. And C3 goes to pin 3. And remember your connections between ground and power. It's not just placing, you know, 5 volts close to each other. It's placing ground and 5 volts. It's the entire loop. Same thing goes for 3.3 volts. So we have two pins here, 2 and 4, that are power. But I'm placing it relative to ground. I'm placing it, you know, kind of like this is semi-optimal. Again, close to the package, but not too close. You don't want to have it like here, so it's really hard to assemble. So that looks all right. We have the power LED, of course, and that will be placed somewhere on the board. Doesn't really matter where. Um, current limiting resistor, we'll place that when we get to it. We have the USB connector, of course. Um, let me just move that here. And the USB data connections come out of the MCU over here. So 33 and 32 are the data connections. And you can see they'll actually be nicely in line with this USB connector. I'm going to give it a bit of space because I need to fit the power supply circuitry probably down here. You can see the power pin VBUS, which needs to be filtered, then it goes in the regulator. So we can probably put the regulator somewhere down here. Let me move that. So I can move this island. So you see how I'm doing it, right? I'm doing all these individual sections and then putting them together and figuring it out piece by piece. So we have C1, C2, and the ferrite bead. And that's going to form our Pi filter. So we have from VBUS going into the capacitor. And again, we, for we didn't place any ESD protection, which you should. But you have ESD protection first, well, the connector, then ESD protection, and then any filtering. So that's what I'm doing here. And I'm doing my Pi filter like this, leaving some space. There we go. So we would have the connector, preferably ESD protection, our Pi filter, and then coming out from our Pi filter into our regulator would be our supply voltage. Now I can rotate this to make sure that my 5 volts goes in there, and that looks much better. Then we have to place our 3.3 volt LED, and this could, of course, be right next to the, the regulator. So let's just do that. Just grouping things like fairly logically together. 
think that looks kind of alright. Now we can't also forget things such as mounting holes because you might want to put this in an enclosure uh, and it's always good to have fairly evenly spaced mounting holes. So we might want to put one in each corner of the board and after that we can then make the board outline. So I can move it around. I'm going to change the grid size by pressing G and one millimeter. And I'm going to put them in approximate positions and just copy that. Control C, Control V, approximate positions for these mounting holes. And I'll figure it out in just a second. Because we might want to move this header just a bit out to make it easily accessible. Uh, we might want to move all this stuff actually a bit more to the right. You know, just you know, just fine tuning the placement, just a, just a tad. I can press Control M to measure the distance between my mounting holes. Thirty three millimeters. Ideally, I would want to make it like thirty or something. So that should be thirty. Thirty. Okay. And ideally, of course, I'd want to make the same distance going to the bottom as well. So thirty is that. So I can just move this mounting hole down one, and that should be 30 9 there we go let me just check this so the control n command is very useful there we go i put them in a little square another way of doing that is of course if you set your origin just to type in the xy coordinates so Imagine we have our mounting holes here, so our board line is going to be around those mounting holes. And then we can actually adjust the position of all these connectors just to fit them. Fit everything. Let's put that in. The way you can make an outline, a really simple one, you can either use it from a step file, so a 3D model, or you can draw it. I typically draw it on, for example, the Make Handle Core 1 layer, or it doesn't really matter what layer. So I can press P and then L or line and then I can start drawing my outline. So I just click and I can draw my outline. The way I can make the rounded corners is by holding shift and pressing space a couple times and then I can actually get rounded corners. So I will just, I will fix the outline in just a second. But let me just draw a really crude one here. Okay, I want to place it of course further away from the mounting holes themselves. So let me just actually redraw that. I didn't do too well on the first try. So let me try that again. So a bit further out. There we go. Maybe something like this. It's a bit better. Uh, and here we go. There. So right click to cancel the command in Altium. Uh, you can change the radius here by clicking on the edge and then you have a corner radius 1.27 millimeters for example uh, Just check if they're all the same 1.27 1.27. So this is probably okay as a board outline. It might be too big The way you then actually set the board outline Let me just move this out for a second Is by selecting your outline I can select one part of it and press tab to select the rest Go to Design, Board Shape, Define Board Shape from Select Object. There we go. Press 3 and I can view. Okay, now I've made a nice little board of that outline. We can check the dimensions. Control M as usual. It's a 36 square. You know, you can make it 40 just to make it sound a bit nicer. But at least the mounting holes are spaced at a fairly nice distance. So 30 millimeters each. Now, now is the time to actually do a bit more fine tuning because the connector positions aren't very good. You can see the lip of this connector is just about out of the PCB edge. This connector over here, you know, it's so far away from the PCB edge that isn't great. So the first thing to do, maybe move this connector down a bit. I don't want the copper of the connector to be that close to the board edge. That's really hard to manufacture. I can move the regulator around a bit. I remember to keep things away from these mounting holes because the screw head will occupy some space around the mounting hole. Um, move my LEDs. This connector, 
I'll move out a bit to make sure you know that the lip of this connector is far enough away from the PCB edge so I can move that in a tiny bit a bit there we go always the 3d view is really nice to check to make sure mechanically everything is sound and this in this way I'm just doing you know, a bit of fine-tuning I'm just moving things where I believe it's probably good for routing and also accessibility for the user later on so that the, the actual uh, debug header make that fairly sensible and easy to access I can give myself a bit more room with the IMU and the spacing just fairly intuitively dragging these things around and moving them around and this you know I probably have far too much space on this board um, but just for the sake of showing the program and showing how to make a little PCB I think this is fair enough okay and we'll make this board a bit prettier with some more silt screen once we are done with the routing. But pretty much now we can we can go over to the routing part. Um, so one thing to do again is in the design rules we have the differential pairs routing routing design rule because we defined our impedance profile as differential ninety for the USB trace. I'm just going to click that and use impedance profile for all differential pairs. Now given that our only differential pair is the USB trace, this makes sense. In different designs, you want to set up different different differential pairs, routing rules, to make sure for HDMI you're using 100 ohms, for USB you're using 90 ohms, for CSI you're using 85 ohms, things like that. Click OK. And then we can go to root, interactive differential pair routing, and root our USB pair. And we can pretty much route that directly in. There we go. So you can see as soon as I come out of the pad, it Altium tries to keep the spacing between them and we can route directly into the pads of our QFN package. Perfect. So really simple. You can see these are both pretty much the same length. We don't have to do any length matching or anything like that. So really, really easy. So we're trying to route critical things first. This could include the USB differential pairs, but it also includes things such as um, uh, the decoupling capacitor connections. So let's do those first. And in no particular order, at least no particular order of the decoupling capacitors, let's just start up here. Control W puts me into the routing mode in Altium. So I can click on a pad, it'll route out. If I press tab, I can change the width of the track. And for now, 0.25 millimeters is pretty much the width of this pad of the QFN, so absolutely fine. I could either just route out and click in, and these pads are connected. Another way to do it, and maybe more elegantly, is Control W, I root out a bit, and once I'm out of the pad, I can increase the width of my track, you know, just gradually. This is pretty nice when routing QFN packages because I can start off with a thick trace and root into my pad. And this looks, I think, quite cool. And it actually helps with the connection, reduces the inductance of the trace. So for power traces, you want thick, wide tracks. Again, Control W, I'm gonna have a 0.5 millimeter track rooted in here. If I press Control W, I can change the way my track is rooted. So, you know, what type of corners I want, things like that. I typically go with uh, the 45 degree mode. There we go. Same with my ground connection, 0.5 millimeter width. There we go, really crude. Now for something as low speed and simple as this, the way you route your power and ground, as long as you're using wide traces, decoupling capacitors close um, to the relevant pins, you'll probably get away with it. So let's just start with 0.25 millimeters. Again, I'm just kind of branching out, getting a bit thicker as I go outside of the package. There we go. And I'm just gonna continue this and root into the packages like this. Let me just actually clean that up a tiny bit. It doesn't look too great. So 0.25 millimeters, rooting out, changing to 0.3 millimeters, just you know, to get that extra big bit of thickness. If I drag on a track, I can move it around. If I hold control, I can kind of fine tune my, my tracks like that. So I'm just gonna do my, my power connections first. So let me do all of those. Again, 0.25 millimeters, going out, changing to 0.3 or even 0.4, and rooting in. Let's do that again, it wasn't too pretty. And of course I can always change my grid sizes and and various things like that. There we go, 0.3, and rooting it out. You can already see right here we might have a problem. 
we can't really root the SWDIO trace out without a via. The via won't fit in here. We can't root past here. So what we have to do is actually move this decoupling capacitor higher up. So I click on trace, tab, delete, tab, delete, and I can move it higher up. This way, I can route my SWIO trace out past the, the capacitor and then up to my connector. So again, I will have to then route out here. I could also or route up here and then go like this, but I know I'm just going to do this for now. There we go. And into the capacitor here and the same for my ground connection. Just change it to point three. And there we go. Again, fine tuning a bit on the fly. All right. So we have some decoupling capacitors over here as well. And this is pretty repetitive. It's not the most exciting thing in the world, but unfortunately it needs to be done. Hopefully it'll get more interesting after we've done this part. There we go. Always fine tuning on the fly just by dragging a bit. Uh, making sure so that our clearance between these is okay. And you can see it's 0 0.2 millimeters, which is just what we set in the rules. So let's go through this. Routing over here and in here. Okay. So we have one more decoupling capacitor here. Doing the same old. That doesn't look nice. Let's do that again. And into there. And the ground connection, and that should hopefully be the last decoupling capacitor. Let's try that again. There we go. All right, so fairly crude for the sake of this. You can spend quite a bit of time actually doing this, and we'll connect the ground and 3.3 volts up as soon, and we'll talk about internal power planes in a few minutes as well. I wanted to finish my main connections, however, and that includes um, the oscillators. So let me route this out. I'm actually going to use a fairly thin trace, so 0 0.2 millimeters, just so I have the, the clearance to get past all of these. So I'm going to route out, and I'm actually going to route up a bit, and then down. I can press space to change my routing angle. There we go, and into the pad. Then I'm going to route this one out, and as soon as I can, I go away from the other trace. I don't. I want to keep the distance between two traces, usually unless they're differential pairs, as far away as I can from each other. With these QFN packages, it's quite hard because the spacing is so narrow. But as soon as I can, I try to give myself a bit of space. So I can change the angle here. And then, of course, I also have my MCUN reset. And that's a bit unfortunate because I will have to actually put a via somewhere here. But let's let's think about that in just a second. All right. Then I have my crystal connections going in. There we go. And that's the reason why I placed the components like this. I can root out, in, 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 and no stubs. There we go. Into there. All right. And we'll look at the ground connections uh, once we talk about power planes. So, let me actually just place a via here. So I can, in Altium, I can root out and then press the star button on my keyboard to place a via. Now you can see this is quite a chunky via and we actually start to set up the design rule for that. So if you go to design rules, um, where was it? Mm, vias, routing via style. The minimum via diameter we want is 0. Uh, let's say 5.5. Five. The maximum we'll put at 0 0.9 and preferred is going to be 0 0.7. That is the diameter of the via pad. And the via hole size will do a minimum of 0 0.25, a maximum of 0 0.4, and preferred is 0 0.3. And again, these rules you will get from your manufacturer. JLC PCB has them on their capabilities section. So now again, if I go back to MCU reset, root and press star, I now want to choose my via. And I will choose a fairly small one 
0.6 via diameter via hole size of 0.25. And this is just so I can make it fit right here. Normally I want larger vias. Larger vias are easier to manufacture uh, to a certain extent and smaller vias can cost more. But I'm just making this via fairly small so I can fit here but also put a via here later for the ground connections. So I'm just pre-planning so to speak. I've rooted MCU and reset out little via and they'll use that then to go over up here where it actually needs to end up later. Okay, we also have these connections over here, which is MCU PA4 to 7, which routes to our little header. And I'll make those a bit larger now, because I have more space. Again, space to change my routing direction. If I have these little kinks, I'll just flatten them out by clicking and dragging, giving myself plenty of space between these um, traces. I could also do something like this, but that's ridiculous because I have so much space in, in the design. I want to space them out as far as I can to eliminate noise, crosstalk, and things like that. Not eliminate, but at least reduce. There we go. So as soon as I can break out and break away from these, that's what exactly what I want to do, right? As soon as I can break out, I want to give myself space between these lines to minimize crosstalk. There we go. Something like that. So I'm doing it fairly crude for the sake of time. And there's a lot you can optimize with this, but for now, this is fine. Also make sure you have plenty of clearance between pads and traces. Uh, what else do we have? We have the serial wire debug connection, which are fairly critical. Control W, just root that out. Again, drag the traces. And pretty much as soon as you can, you know, get away from not uh, relevant uh, or not uh, traces that need to be close to each other. The clock line for serial wire debug needs to be rooted up here as well. And the serial wire trace line. As you can see, I'm keeping as much distance as I can realistically and aesthetically can. I could route them like this, but that's, as I said, pretty ridiculous. You want to keep as much distance as you reasonably can between traces, signal traces, that is, and also power traces. Then we have the I squared C lines, clock. As soon as I come out of the pin, I'm going right to give myself space. And I'm going into this to, um, pull up resistor. Same with the SDA. I'm giving myself a bit of a space, then keeping space between the clock line. There we go. A typical guideline is between your inner layer or your next reference layer and your signal layer, it should be about three times the width of that, of that uh, distance. Uh, I believe, what was it for us, that distance? Let me just have a look. 0 0.2 millimeters. So should it at least be 0 0.6 millimeters of space between these traces? So between here and here, you know, at least 0 0.6 millimeters. I have 0 0.5 here. So, you know, I could improve that a bit. But there we go. Maybe just improve that a tiny bit. Give me a bit more space. There we go. For something as low speed and with fairly slow rise and fall times, such as these uh, I, I, I squared C lines, it's pretty much okay. MCU boot zero, straight into that pad. And as I pre-planned before, the IMU interrupt pin will go out left of that pad and to the left here. Again, adjusting so I have ample space between pads and traces. I also know I'm gonna to have to be placing a via somewhere around here maybe for the ground and power connections. So that's why maybe I could, I don't have to put my trace like this, I can keep it out a bit further. Okay, I will route up the I squared C connections in just a bit as well, and also the IMU. Uh, I can just route up this LED, that's really non-critical over here. Of course I could also here because it's, you know, it's carrying a couple milliamps this trace is it as wise as it needs to be. It's a 0 0.25 millimeter. Is it 0 0.25 millimeter? Yeah, 0 0.25 millimeter trace. That can carry, you know, a couple hundred milliamps of current. Um, so, you know, it's fair enough. You can make these traces a bit bigger. I could make this 0 0.4 millimeters, but there's no real point. Okay, so let's root up the IMU. Again, fairly wide traces going between decoupling capacitors and relevant pads. That's what I'm doing here. Regulator out, IMU out. There we go. And ground. 
and 3.3 volts. Fairly short white traces is what we want, right? We have short white traces to minimize our inductance. Then we have the I2C, SCL, and data lines. So we have the data line here and the clock line. And we'll need to use a via to jump over. Unfortunately, you know, the SDA line goes like this and the SCL line has to cross it at some point. So we'll need to use a via. So I break out, I immediately go down because I want to give myself space from the SDA line. Go over here. I can also press P and then V to place the via. And I'll make a 0 0.7 millimeter pad, 0 0.3 millimeter drill and pop that over there. Then on the bottom layer, which is layer four, I can click here, control W to root, and I root over here, and P, V to place a via, and then root on the top layer. There we go. So that's the way I can place vias. So vias allow me to change between layers. I've gone from the top layer here, through a via, through the board on the other side, gone over this side and back up again to jump over this connection. All right. So we also have the IMU interrupt pin over here. I'll just route that like this. It's a very uh, non-critical signal. It just goes high or low if the data is ready. And I have all of these ground connections and things like that as well, but we'll come to that in just a bit. The in reset connection over here. So, as you saw, I did critical connections first, decoupling capacitors, uh, crystals, higher speed signals, and then I do all the low speed stuff and all the power routing. You can probably already tell that a four layer board is complete overkill for this design, but I'm doing it to show you about internal ground layers and uh, internal layers, as well as how to route uh, controlled and piece and traces, for example, for this USB differential pair. It's not strictly required because this is only USB full speed, uh, pretty slow, and you know the distance is so short, so it actually really doesn't matter. It's just for example and because four layer boards have gotten so cheap, so why not? Okay, so now we have some the ground connections to root, we have the power connections to root, and so forth. The way I typically like to root my power is with power or ground pause, power floods, how you could call them. I can either route them as traces, so just coming out, you know, and pop that in there, or I can use uh, the polygon feature, which is a copper pore. The way I do that is press P and then go to polygon pore. A uh, shortcut is P and then G, and then I can essentially draw the outline of my polygon. G to change the grid, and then I start drawing. And I can just, as it is, a polygon, just draw essentially a big copper fill. And if I'm starting off with VBUS and just making, you know, just a little connection here. Right click to finish, and then I need to give it a net. And I will call this VBUS because it's I want to root all the VBUSes together. Click Repore. And there we go. I have a copper area that is connected to all these pads. And this is really useful because for power, we want pretty, pretty wide traces to carry the current. And of course, in this case, we always have we have next to zero current being drawn, or very little comparatively. But typically, I think it's good practice to try to maximize your trace widths or use copper or, or puddles uh, to connect these things together. So let me just do that for the rest here. Again, I want to keep space between various copper pores or polygons, as they're called. Right click to finish. I need to assign the net, plus five volts, press enter, and then always re pour. I will do the same thing for ground later on, but let me get to that in just a second. And let me just do these remaining connections first. You can see I actually need to link five volts here to the five volts down here. If I've already made a polygon, I can click modify and then modify the polygon. So I can have it come out like this, for example, and just link that up as well. So I'm doing it fairly crude. You can be much nicer about this and not strictly necessary for this design to use it, but I think it's fairly good practice. There we go. And then report to report. And this way, you you know, you have a fairly wide connection. Of course, this doesn't look very pretty at the moment. And you can kind of widen it out. You can play around with it a bit. Things like that. 
you can definitely spend a fair bit of ta time getting this, you know, to look somewhat decent. But this is, you know, it'll do for now. Then we have our 3.3-watt 3 3 connections. Again, just doing a fairly crude layout. Here we go. Three volts, repour. There we go. Okay, so now we've done kind of a little power section here with a trace of or some copper pores just to link everything up. Okay, so let's see what is to do next. Um, I typically wouldn't connect things like LEDs or little resistors uh, directly to the copper pore. You might have problems with solderability. So, if you're not well here, I will just do a little trace coming out. The thing is, if I now click on my copper pore and repour it, you see it's done this little notch. The reason for that is, uh, in Altium Designer, you have this option over here in the copper pore, and you have to set that to pour over all same net objects and then repour, and then you won't have that problem. All right, let's move that here. There we go. Okay, and I think we just have the end reset connection which we have to root over there. And then we can do our ground and power routing. So I clicked on my bottom layer. And I'm routing that as a 0 0.3 millimeter trace on the bottom layer over here and up. Actually, let me just do it over here. There we go. Yeah. As you can see, complete overkill using a four layer board. We pretty much only have two traces rooting on the bottom and we could have easily done that on the top, right? I could have made a small jump here, rooted around around the around the IMU and into the end reset line. That would have been fine as well. But let's just do it like this for now. So place a via, connect that up and it roots into the our little serial wire debug header. Okay, so what we're going to do now is actually on both internal layers, we will put ground planes. I can double click on the layers, I will call it L2 brackets ground, this is typically my naming convention, and L3 brackets ground. I'll call my layer 1, double click, I'll just do L1, and I'll call that signal, and I'll call my bottom layer, layer 4, also a signal layer. Now, click on layer 2, my internal ground plane. I will choose my grid to be 1 millimeter. I'll press P and then G to start my copper pore. Now, I will click Control, uh, sorry, Shift Space to change my corner style and just start drawing my outline for my internal ground plane. Once you're happy with that, right click to end the command. And you can see it's already poured it, but it doesn't have a net. So type in the net and read pour. And I have a ground plane. All right. And so this ground plane is a reference plane for all the signals that run above it. Similarly, layer three will be the reference plane for all signals that run on layer four. So I can do, I can click on my layer two ground plane, copy, go to layer three. And now I need to do edit, paste special. I want to paste it on the current layer and I want to keep the net name. There we go. Paste. I think it's shifted a bit, unfortunately. And it's not playing nice, so let's try that. I just have to adjust a bit. There we go. Finally made it fit. And repo. And now I also have a ground plane on layer three. So I have signal, top, layer two is ground, layer three is ground, layer four signal. Now this stack up is really nice for signal integrity for EMI because the top and bottom have a good reference plane to reference to for the return path. You can see also I use the command shift S and that toggles the visibility of layers. So once you start having ground planes, it's really annoying if you're on layer one and you want to root, you have this big orange or whatever color that is plane underneath. So if I press shift S, I can, okay, just view the top plane. Shift S again, really just view the top plane and so forth. So shift S is a great command and so forth. Once I've drawn my ground planes, I don't really need to see those layers anymore for now. So I can right click, hide, 
right click hide that means I only have my you know interesting layers uh, to view so to speak all right so the cool thing is now every time I have a ground connection I have a wide trace so I'll probably do 0.5 millimeters and I just press star on my keyboard so close to the pad but not this close not as close to the solder mask opening as you want just like here there we go I have a thick wide trace going out from the pad in to the ground layers below. And this way I can connect all of my grounds up with a really low inductance path. 0.5 millimeters, star to drop a via, or asterisk rather. There we go, and that's what I'm gonna be doing for the rest. So let me just do that for all of the ground connections. So now I've pretty much added vias and short white traces to all of the ground connections you can see here. So I have a ground pad, I come up with a very short and wide trace and dig down into the internal ground planes. And this way these are all then connected together. One thing I wanted to show you here with the power section, again, I have placed vias close to the pads, but not too close. And I'm not gonna use traces, I'm actually gonna use a big copper pore to connect these up. So let me just do that. So again, P and G, and I'm just gonna draw like what is called, I believe, like a power puddle, just to link all of these together. There we go. Almost there. Right click to end the command, give it a net, and click refill. There we go. So we have all these vias digging down into the internal ground planes. Uh, we have this, these copper poles over here. And what's left to do, we've done the connector, is pretty much just the 3.3 volt power routing. Now, oftentimes you also see designs, and I also showed that in my previous video on uh, KiCad SCM32 board design, is using one of the internal layers as a 3.3 or whatever voltage you're running at uh, power plane. And this is fine, uh, but I've typically moved on to just using ground planes and then routing my power. For something as low speed as this, uh, that's completely fine. Once you start moving over to really high speed digital circuits, you will need to have dedicated power planes. And they all have, typically have a higher board, count, uh, board layer counts as well. So with this, all I would then do is have a white trace coming out of the regulator, typically from the actual bypass capacitor, so I'll have something like, I know, let's say a, a millimeter is, is pretty wide, uh, routing through the board and then linking up all these components. So I might have to use vias as well and then also get narrower at certain places. So I'll have to, you know, go down and then to 0 0.5 millimeters and then this way link up all my components. And this is a perfectly viable or viable method of doing this. So from the output capacitor, of my uh, regulator, wide traces going over the board and hooking up to whatever I need 3.3 volts. And then of course using vias to bridge gaps if I need to go underneath and so forth. I could also alternatively also use the bottom plane, just fill that with 3.3 volts and then dig down. So why don't we do that? We could. The reason we might want to do that is that that might create a copper imbalance because we have maybe a large plane of copper down here, we have limited copper up here, and that might create some board warp. So that's why I typically don't fill the signal layers with copper, or if I do, then I will do it symmetrically and just keep my two internal ground lanes for a four layer board. So I will just finish up the routing uh, for this 3.3 volt bus and I'll show you the result. So here I've gone up from the regulator um, just drawing a very wide and thick trace all around the board. So let me just do that. Then when I have to jump, I will just do a via, short wide trace, and via up again. Now there's probably better ways of doing this, more elegant ways, but for this board that is absolutely fine. So I'm just going around, every time I need to branch off, I can just do a short wide trace, getting larger, and getting larger again into there. Now, whatever someone says about right angle corners, uh, they're absolutely fine to use in PCB design, so don't worry about that, especially for power traces. 
there are some sections when you're doing power planes and you might have right angles in uh, very high current power planes you might get some high much higher current density in those corners but for the most part it's it's probably okay to use right angle corners So this is will be the last step of our routing. And then we can actually get on to making this board or getting it manufactured. So that's pretty cool. So I'm always using tab to change my sizes. Of course, you can make some nice rules in Altium to do this automatically for you. So if you're routing through from three volts, you can say, okay, you need to route this as a half a millimeter and so forth. But I'm just doing it fairly manually. I'm sure there's much better ways of doing this. And of course the trace doesn't actually have to be this wide. Uh, like a one millimeter trace can handle a considerable amount of current. But if you have the space, why not? Right. So again, if I need to bridge a gap, I can just place a via, route on the bottom layer, go over, and another via to get to the top, and then just route from the pad into that via, for example. Again, making sure I can have a nice clearance between tracks and so forth. You can see, I can shoot from this via, I want to continue on. Maybe going along here. And just wiggling my way through the board. Now, you probably don't have to make the, well, you really don't have to make the trace that wide because these are just pull-up resistors. They pretty much draw barely any current. So we can get away actually using a thinner trace here and that will give us better tolerances, or better clearances, rather. So we go here, and just at the last moment, I then narrow my trace down a bit to maybe 0 0.3 millimeters, and this gives us better clearance, for example. And often, this can be a bit fiddly, but I'm sure we'll get there. All right, there we go, that's that. I'm just making sure I have enough clearance. Then I just need to route this power trace over there. And I think then we have, have it. So, and the way we make this is a bit better. Even though this will create a, a bit of a stub in the end reset line, doesn't really matter because we can just root the end reset signal like this. There we go. And this way we don't have to do a via to root the 3.3 volts. We do have a bit of a stub getting here, but it really, really doesn't matter in this case. I guess it's more of an OCD thing. Okay, and we just go 3.3 volts here. Routing over here. Getting a bit thicker again, as usual. And there we go. And now that should have almost our 3.3 volts, all of them routed. We have this little jump here we have to make. So again, coming out, increasing in width. We can actually make this go up here. Little via. And then we just jump that, place a via, make sure to select the right net, and then effectively just root that out on the top layer. Just change that bit here. We 
we go. And something like that. It's pretty crude. It's not, not the greatest, but for the sake of time and just like a first pass, I think that's okay. We can view it in 3D view, of course. You can see, you know, the signal traces are fairly thin, as thin as they have to be or can be within the manufacturer's uh, tolerances. One thing I see here, which you shouldn't do, the ground plane should always be underneath um, all traces, even if it's something as a power trace. So we might want to extend or make this track just a bit thinner there, just to make sure the ground trace is completely underneath it. So let me just adjust that. So that's why the 3D view can be quite helpful as well, as you just saw. There we go. Let's see, is that better? Let me just move that in a bit. There we go. Now, I still need to re pull my ground planes. As you can see, there's the hole here from the previous via. So the way to do that, to report all ground planes, is to go to Tools, Polygon Pulls, Report All. We also have that ground, that 3 uh, 3 volt connection over here. I'll just do a little jumper there. There we go. So as I said, really crude. Nothing fancy, nothing special. But I think it does the job. Okay, so that's pretty much all connections are rooted. What we can do now is do um, a design rule check. So we go to tools, um, design rule check, just run the design rule check. And we'll see, okay, actually we have quite a lot of design rule problems. Let's go through them. We have a clearance constraint because we've set, actually our minimum clearance should be 0 0.2 across the board. I just set that because it's you know, just really easy. We have a whole size constraint, minimum solder mask layer and silk to solder mask. We have no short circuits and no unrooted nets, so that's already a first good sign. Let me just go uh, a bit of messages, bring that up again. Annoyingly, it does that. Let me just try that again. Okay, so let's just go through an example and see why they're probably okay. With all these clearance constraints, you can see the smallest clearance is 0 0.15 millimeters. If we look at JLC PCB capabilities, that's actually well above their capabilities. So that's fine. We can change the design rule and then get rid of these clearance concern errors. The minimum, the maximum hole size is uh, 2.5 volt according to our rules. We're using 3.2 millimeter holes. We can just adjust the rule and get rid of that. That's definitely not a constraint at JLC PCB. There are these things called solder mask slivers. So how much solder mask is actually uh, between the pads? And right now, there's no solder mask between the pads. And this can be pretty bad because you can gauge solder bridges. So during the soldering process, uh, these can bridge. But as long as the stencil is made uh, okay, you, you deposit enough or the right amount of solder paste, this could be okay. It depends on your manufacturer's capabilities, how much solder mask sliver can be there, right? Right now, I've just kept the default solder mask sliver at 0 0.254 millimeters, which is huge. Uh, and you need to check JLC's website to see what they can actually do. I know I've had the IMU assembled before with these uh, settings, with these solder mask openings and slivers, and also this uh, MCU, so actually we can ignore all these sliver constraints. The last one is the silk to solder mask clearance. So um, we might have, you know, solder mask here, solder mask openings here, and uh, silk screen around it. And Altium doesn't like that, and we can set up different rules for that. And that's something you should do for the sake of time. I know this design will work, and this uh, I have had these boards produced at JLC, and everything's gone fine. But you should set up your design rules properly to match the manufacturer. For the sake of time, we won't do it now, so let's move on. So the design rules looks fine. It's pretty much just warnings right now. Uh, so what we need to do is make this board a bit neater, maybe add you know, a logo or something and add some text. The way to do that is press two, go to the top overlay, uh, place, press P, and then we can place a string. So for example, I want to give um, these connectors, maybe names. So I'll do serial wire debug. Is this connector over here? I can change the stroke width, the text height, and so forth. I'll do that 1.5 millimeters. 
and 0.25 millimeter stroke width. So maybe that's a bit too large. 3D viewer to check. Remember to not place any silk screen above holes. So I'll make this a bit smaller just to keep myself a bit of clearance. And I can change the alignment and so forth. Okay. So serial wire debug, it's always a good idea just to, you know, tell the user what different parts are. Then we have USB over here. Uh, I can change the justification. 3D viewer just to check if it looks f somewhat decent. Um, then we have the GPIO connector. Over here, you know, we might put that on top here. And so forth. You know, you can add silk screen to your liking. There we go. I think that looks, you know, not great, but not bad. We can also place graphics. So we place place graphics. And here we go. I can choose my logo, for example. And then just align that somehow. There we go. Put a logo on in PNG, JPEG format, whatever you have. And, you know, of course, component uh, indicators, orientations, you want a little circle and you want to indicate the diode directions and so on. That's pretty much it. For JLC assembly, we now need to add tooling holes. You can, of course, have them add tooling holes, but we'll just do it. Just copy one of these mounting holes, place it somewhere, um, change the designator to TH for tooling hole, no net, and it needs to be 1.152 pad and hole. And you can place that somewhere where there's no tracks and opposite sides of the board. And this is what they need for assembly. There we go, change that to no net. These shouldn't be plated either. Let me just double check. There we go. Then tools, polygon pores, report all. And let's make sure all the ground pores are reported. And yeah, so this is a really simple breakout board. I think we're at about, what, two and a half hours now when we've gotten this far. Now, all we need to do is get this board ordered and then assembled by JLC PCB. So for that, we need to create the Gerber files, which are the board production files, the bill of materials, and the component placement files. And that's pretty straightforward to do. So remember to run your design rule checks, all of this kind of stuff. Check your design like a hundred times before you're ready um, uh, to get it produced. We'll rush this a bit. So we'll do file, fabrication outputs, Gerber X2 files. My units will be millimeters. Uh, the format is fine. I don't, you don't need this. And then you need to select the layers you want to plot. Typically, I'll start with over here, clicking used on. I want the profile, I want the top silk screen, I want the paste, solder mask, I want all the copper layers. I want the solder mask at the bottom, I want the paste at the bottom, I want the legend at the bottom. I don't want any of these mechanical layers. These are just for my reference or for 3D bodies and so forth. I want the pads, top and bottom. I also want drills, so I want the non-plated through hole and I want a plated through hole. Then click OK and we'll generate the Gerber files. Give that just a second, and it'll open this Camtastic viewer, and it'll show you all the exported layers here. Right-click and turn them all off, and then go through them one by one to see if everything looks, you know, in order. This is the top copper, this is the inner ground plane, bottom ground plane, copper signal, and so forth. See, by checking these Gerber files, I already realized that we forgot stitching views. We have the ground pause in the inner two layers, and we need to add some vias connected to ground across all of this board to make sure these are connected together. Now we have a low inductance connections. So the way we do that is press P, V, I'm just gonna change my grid to one millimeter, and I can place vias. I can either do that or use Altium's via stitching tool. So go to tools, via stitching, and add stitching to net. I will um, do simple, my hole size is 0 0.4, my diameter is 0 0.8. I want tenting on top and bottom. Um, so I want the vias covered with solder mask. Let me want, my grid is 2.5 millimeters, seems about right, maybe two millimeters. There we go. And let's click okay and see what that does. You can see 
Altium's added some stitching viewers, which is okay. This might be a bit, you know, tight, uh, this, this stitch over here, and we can add some more ourselves. But you can see the idea that we want to connect the top or the inner two ground planes together. I can add some more here, just where, um, where Altium hasn't placed them properly. Also, moving a bit further away from the ground, um, pause. Vias in um, silkscreen aren't great, so I'm just going to get rid of them. Let me just try this. So it's also placed ground vias really close to the pads. So let me just actually just do it manually for now. Normally this works fairly well. Uh, I don't know why it's having a bit of a bad day today. So I'm just going to place some vias manually. You can, of course, make this a lot neater, but just for the sake. Let me just do that. So now I've placed some stitching viewers, and you can see in the 3D view, just to stitch these ground planes together. As a last check, let me just close uh, this. And let me just re pull all the polygon pulls. And then, of course, do another design rule check to see if anything new has cropped up. Hopefully not. That we don't have any short circuits or unconnected nets, and it's pretty much the same warnings as before. So now we can return back to actually generating our, our production files. So we do file, um, fabrication outputs, go back to files. We've already set this up, so just click OK. And then again, we can check the files one by one, and this time with stitching viewers. So you would check that, and that all seems all right so far. Altium has exported the GOA files in the directory and then under project outputs. There are some files that you don't need, and I typically just delete those. Delete these. And then I add them to a GOA file, uh, sorry, a zip file or a RAW file. There we go, and I'll just call them something sensible, Altium 2 board. Gerber files. Then I can delete those because they're in the Gerber file. Okay, so there's our Gerber files which we can use for production if we want bare boards, but we want them assembled. So we go back to Altium, click uh, File, Assembly Outputs, and Generate Pick and Place files. We want units to be metric, we want them to be in CSV format, and that's about it. Click OK. We can go back to the folder and they should have been generated there. Then we can just rename this file to be Altium STM32 board-cpl. Double click on it, and we have to make some changes. So we can get rid of all this stuff over here. For JLC to accept this file, we need to change this up here, center x millimeters, to mid blank x, and center y to mid blank y. Also, you see all these top layers here. Top layers have to go to bottom layer. Uh, sorry, top layer has to go to top only. So click replace all, and that's it. Okay, so that's where we have our Gerber files. Now we have our footprint position files. Now we need our bill of materials. So you can go to uh, Altium again, click reports, bill of materials. Wait till that loads. and we want it in file format CSV and click export. And we wanna export that with the name as dash BOM or bill of materials. Click okay. And we need to edit that file as well. So open it, get rid of this line. We need to add a column called LCSC part number. Then we need to add an extra column with all the LCSC part numbers. The way we then fill in this bill of materials file is go to jlcpcb, go to jlcpcb.com slash parts, find the relevant part and copy over the jlcpcb part number. So for example, for this Molex connector, this USB connector, we just copy that um, and then we need to find it in here, which is over here, and then copy that in. 
and we do that for all the components. So if I look for my um, microcontroller, pop that in here, click on it, LCSC part number, and just copy that in. And you do that for all these parts. So let me just do that. Okay, so I filled in this column with the LCS part number for pretty much everything. Of course, Altium has added the tag connect header and that's not really a part, so we can get rid of that. And this JSTGH header, they don't have in stock at the moment, so I'm not gonna have them assemble that, so I can get rid of that uh, row as well. But other than that, everything is filled in and we're pretty much ready to order. So we go to JLC PCB, click instant quote, and then we click add Gerber file. Then we go to project outputs, choose our Gerber, let that upload, and then we have to select the parameters for our PCB. Just give that a second. And here it is uploaded. We can use their Gerber viewer just to check if everything looks kind of all right. It's automatically found the dimensions. We can choose how many we want. Uh, I don't know, let's say 10. Um, all of this is fine. We want an impedance control board with this stack up. The top layer is top, then inner, inner, and bottom. PCB color will keep us green. For the surface finish, I typically go with lead-free, hot air surface loading, or immersion nickel gold. Let's go lead-free to make it a bit cheaper. Uh, you can play around with the material type and things like that. Um, remove order number. I would like to, so I'll just click yes, and that adds like a dollar fifty to it. Uh, but at least you won't have like a JLC order number on it. Then, of course, we want SMT assembly. So let's click on that. We want the top side assembled, and we've added the tooling holes ourselves already. So once you're happy with that, click Confirm. And the next page is then to add the bill of materials and our component placement file. So bill of materials and component placement, and click Next. Then hopefully the system will register everything. And this is what we uploaded on the left here, and this is what they the automatic system matched. So it's good to check you know, the, the value or the type of component with what they think it is. This is essentially the part number we typed in. Just go through one by one, checking if all this all looks right. And let me just do that quickly. Everything's right. The crystals, everything, LEDs, resistors, the right MCU, capacitors, seems all right so far. Okay, then we click next, and now we have to review the parts placement to make sure the orientations are okay. Now, engineers at JLC PCB will actually check this for you, so it's not entirely critical if you do this yourself, but you can save time and save them the hassle, and I typically always do that. So let's just wait until it's ready. As luck would have it, the JLC system is currently not working, but you would essentially see the orientations of your components, and if there are some issues with that, you will then open your component placement file over here, and you would have to then adjust uh, the rotation of the components. Uh, typically, this isn't an issue if you just submit the board and the engineers will get back to you to adjust the placement, and they will then send you an email asking you if this placement is correct. So you can pretty much, well, in essence, skip this step and then just click Save to Cut. Uh, and component placement, you can see here, you'll have this kind of preview. Uh, just to see if everything's aligned with the dots. And that's why the silk screen helps to indicate to the engineers at JLCPCB also where and how to orientate the components. So once you're done, for 10 boards, it's about $135, almost fully assembled, which is really cool. It's about $13.50 per board uh, without shipping and, of course, import duties wherever you live. And then, yeah, save to cart and you're pretty much done. So thank you very much for watching this video. I hope it's been okay and you've learned something for Altium Designer and see how that compares to KeyCAD. Um, if you haven't subscribed already, please subscribe to the channel and leave a like if you can. Thanks very much and I'll see you in the next video.